At a time when our world faces an unprecedented energy crisis, the need for transformative solutions has never been more urgent. But within crisis lies opportunity. Welcome to the second annual Tribeca Future Facing Commodities Conference held in the heart of Singapore. Over the next three days, we're not just discussing the challenges, we're diving deep into solutions, beginning with the technologies and resources that will pave the way to a carbon neutral future. This is where the leaders of today shape the energy landscape of tomorrow. A gathering of minds ready to invest, innovate and inspire. Together, we will discover unparalleled investment opportunities, learn from the pioneers at the forefront of the energy transition and connect with like-minded professionals committed to making a difference. The future is not just what happens next, it's what we create. Welcome to the second annual Tribeca Future Facing Commodities Conference. As the crowd files in, I say welcome to the second annual Tribeca Future Facing Commodities Conference. Nice little video there from the voiceover from our MC Chrissy, but that explains a little bit about what we're about, what we're trying to achieve with this event. Um, it's not just a mining conference, it's, it's the process, it's the end result. Um, I'll start with thanking our foundation sponsors, Tribeca, uh, Scott Clements on my right down here will talk shortly. Of course, you know Tribeca is a big fund manager here in Singapore and Australia. Uh, they've bitten the bullet, taken the vision of what we want to achieve with this, with this conference. So we thank Scott and his team at Tribeca for being on board. Argonaut, the Australian stockbroker. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone from Argonaut's in the room, but the whole team's up here. They've got a big booth next door. Make sure you say hi to Argonaut. They're very, uh, very resource focused in their investment. North Point Equity, Warwick Hazeldine, Warwick's in the room. I thank Warwick for his help and his mentorship through you know, when we try to put the programs together and, and the contacts that they have. So it's a very important, um, very important group of founders that we have and we look forward to going forward with them. We also have uh, my own team, Vertical Events and Interlang Marketing and Consulting. Uh, and all that leads into Resource Connect Asia. So it's Resource Connect Asia bringing you this conference. As I said last year, we got a five year vision to turn this into a, a, major, a major mining investment event in the ASEAN region. And this year we've achieved a little more of the ASEAN uh, people coming to the show. Next year, hopefully a few more. Uh, that's what we want to achieve. We want to make it you know, the place in, on the calendar for the ASEAN investment. I'd like to also thank um, some sponsors. SRK, of course, great sponsor. They also sponsored the drinks last night with the mining club. Intertech Minerals, we have the ASX, we have the Lind Partners. METS are our name badge, Excalibur. Casia are our diversity sponsor. They'll be on a panel later in the week. Benchmark, of course, giving a couple of keynotes. Digby is our ESG sponsor and RPM Global for Innovation. We thank all them. We also have PKF as our accounting and corporate sponsor. We have a few company sponsors, Atha Energy Corp, Azure. Now, a lot's going to be said about Azure in the next half an hour, so I, won't, I don't need to say much. Gallon, of course, Gallon have got their, uh, their brine operation in Argentina. And then we have on Thursday the breakfast sponsor, which is the West Australian Government. Also on the screen behind me, you'll see all our supporters and our, our media partners. Uh, too many to name. But I'd just like to mention uh, one in particular, and that's uh, Omar from Spark Plus. He's sitting in the back row. He's been a great help and uh, he's taken on board what we're trying to achieve, so we thank him for his efforts. But you'll see them all there. Make sure you contact them all during the week. 
Go and, go and talk to them. Some have booze, some don't, but they'll be around. The, the purpose of putting on an event like this is to draw attention to the region and draw attention to the investment that is needed in the, in the decarbonisation world. Um, as I said, it's not just a mining conference. It's a, it's a global event, and that's what we want to achieve. You'll see on the screen behind me a list of, of topics that we're going to cover over the next three days. It's quite extensive. Um, in fact, it's very, very good. We have a lot of keynotes this year, and I want to thank a couple of those. We have keynotes from, from London, keynotes from the USA and, and Australia. We have a breakfast speaker on Thursday, Steve Oaken, talking about the US election, so that'll be interesting. But these uh, keynote speakers have, um, have made a, a big effort and a big journey. Uh, Stephen, um, Joe Lowry, the famous Joe Lowry, of course, is here in the room. We have Henry Sanderson from Benchmark, Michael Finch from, from London from Benchmark. And it's great that these people are getting on board and, and coming to our show here in Singapore. That's about all I want to say for now. Um, it's now my duty to, or my pleasure, to introduce the MC for the next three days, Chrissy Morrissey and she'll take you through our journey on the race to go green. So Chrissy, welcome and over to you. Thanks, Stuart. Good morning, everyone. How wonderful to be here. It's lovely to be your MC, following on from the success of last year's inaugural conference and wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the audience, some of you who've traveled up from Australia and others that we met here last year. Now, as Stewie mentioned, it's a jam-packed three days. We've got lots to cover and lots to get through and some really interesting and impressive people that have traveled from all over the world to be part of this event. Now, over the three days, I'm gonna encourage you not just to listen, but to engage. I want you to ask questions, go up and talk to people and get information. And also it's the opportunity for you over the next three days to network. It's an unparalleled loud networking opportunity for all of you, so please make the most of it. Um, I'm going to outline the mechanics of the day just before our first presenta presenter gets up on stage, so we'll hold off on the details when I've got the majority of our presenters in the room because it's really important that they hear those details. Uh, and a couple of things to point out that I would like to point you to. We do have a Wi-Fi connection, so the details are up here for you. So if you'd like Wi-Fi, that's there. It's also in your programs that are in front of you. We have published hard copy programs this year, but that's going to be slowly, slowly phased out as we all move to a more sustainable future as well. So the details are in there, and there is a code in the book. There's also a code up here I'll show to you, and that's for our event app. So as we phase out the books and the, and the printed programs, we'll be going digital. So please make use of that app as well to get you around. All right, we're going to make these three days a cornerstone for solutions and also so for growing our collective wealth, which we're very much looking forward to. To kick us all off, we're doing an education to start with, and the gentleman that's going to address you about that is, uh, well, he manages Tribeca Singapore office, corporate advisory group. That includes a 25-year-old multi-billion dollar asset management business and private wealth. Um, I'd like you all please to welcome to the stage Scott Clements from Tribeca. Thank you, Chrissy, and uh, thank you, everyone, for turning up. I know it's uh, a bit early for a Singapore audience, but it's not a bad crowd. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Stuart and all the Vertical Events team. Uh, they've been our partners in this uh, journey over the last year or two, and uh, I've been to a lot of conferences over the years, but I'd never realized all the work that goes into behind the scenes to make it work properly. And they do a great job, and uh, they've been good partners, and I've probably seen a bit too much of Stuart over the last couple months, so I won't be too sorry not to have to calling me every day, but uh, they've been a great, uh, a great help making this thing work. Um, the, the vision for this conference really came from the fact that uh, I've lived here for 20 years and been to a lot of pretty average conferences, and so we were thinking, why don't we try and create an event that, that we would find interesting and that we would be interested in attending? And um, so hopefully 
some of you find some interesting things over the next few days. Uh, we've got a great group of keynote speakers, as uh, Stewie mentioned. Uh, we've got some great expert panels and um, pretty interesting companies. So uh, hopefully you get something out of it. Uh, so, but quick, a quick uh, infomercial about Tribeca. As Chrissy said, we're a we're a 25 year old firm. We started in Sydney. Uh, we're very Australian at the core, despite my Canadian accent and our New York sounding name. Um, we manage a number of fund strategies in Australian equities. Uh, we do a lot in global natural resources and we have some thematic funds, uh, one of which is our nuclear fund run by uh, Guy Keller down here. You'll hear from him on a panel later. Um, we run a couple of Asian funds here in Singapore. Uh, we have an Asia credit fund uh, that John Stover runs. You'll, you'll see him later. That's the best performing uh, credit fund in Asia. And uh, last year we launched an Asian infrastructure fund that's managed by Suzanta Mazumdar, who I think is on tomorrow. Um, so there's a few Tribeca people kicking around. We've got our group CEO, Adam Labus, here as well. And uh, our head of marketing, Alex Lupus, uh, he's got a stack of investment uh, subscription forms that are pre-filled, so you just have to sign them. So he'll come and find you over the drinks uh, session and probably later on. Um, anyway, so that's, that's us. And when we were thinking about what to talk about today, uh, I was thinking back to a year ago, and you know things have changed quite a lot in some ways. I mean, lithium prices were down 80% last year, which has been um, you know impactful for a lot of people that attended. Uh, but in a lot of ways, some of the big themes are still the same. And so we've got, we would call them three big investment themes at the moment, and we wanted to talk a little bit about how they seem quite different, but they're actually quite connected. Um, so energy transition and decarbonization, obviously it's quite relevant to this event. Um, there's been decades of debate and disagreement around climate change, um, but in the last number of years, a consensus has been reached, uh, both publicly and privately, that something needs to be done. And electrifying transport and industry and reducing the carbon intensity of power generation uh, and just generally incentivizing society to reduce carbon. This is a big, big theme and it, all of these things require massive amounts of capital and will take years to, to execute. Another big theme is onshoring supply chains. Uh, we're living in a time of geopolitical tension that's really unprecedented since the Second World War and uh, with China challenging the US for global superpower status, that's created this incentive for Western governments to realize that it's unwise to concentrate supply chains in China. Um, and so we're seeing uh, massive uh, amounts of investment onshore. We're seeing a renaissance in manufacturing. And um, I think alongside a, a realization, a growing realization, particularly among Western governments about how far advanced China is in terms of technology and every other aspect. And then of course you can't talk about big investment themes without talking about AI and, and big tech. Um, they get more airtime than any investment theme at the moment. Uh, I guess I could throw crypto in there too, but it's not that kind of conference. Uh, but um, the big tech, it, it, big tech has dominated investment flows for years. And uh, AI's more recent phenomena is the technology has matured and we've seen uh, uh, the public become more exposed to it through things like chat GPT and in some ways the hype is absolutely justified. I mean technology has fundamentally changed many, many parts of our lives uh, and AI will disrupt pretty much every business out there. But when you look at how the money is flowing into these themes, it's actually quite narrowly focused. So if you look at energy transition and decarbonization, um, on the one hand, you have very large institutional investors looking for big infrastructure type investments. So big ticket, um, stable returns, reasonably low internal rates of return. Um, and so that's for pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and these, these big institutional investors. Uh, and then at the other end, you have a lot of new climate tech uh, venture capital money and, and Bill Gates' uh, breakthrough energy ventures is probably one of the most prominent investors. And 
they've brought the venture capital model to this space where you put, you know, you make a number of bets and most of them won't pay off, but the ones that do will come become pretty big businesses. In um, onshoring supply chains, this is very much a government game. So you have these uh, so-called helicopter money from governments supporting the private sector, building downstream infrastructure, um, on either onshore or in friendly jurisdiction. Um, and the money is big. I mean, the IRA alone is estimated to put over 800 billion into uh, the US over the next few years. And the EU, Canada, Australia, every other Western country are all committing billions and, and billions of dollars in uh, grants and loans and tax credits and, and everything else to support this onshoring. Um, and, you know, they need to. It's the only way the, the West has a chance of catching up to, to China's head start in, in some of these industries. And then for AI and big tech, this is very much an equity game. So uh, the flows into the Magnificent Seven has had a lot of press. Uh, it is unprecedented for seven stocks to be 30% of the S&P 500. Uh, and there's been a similar frenzy in, in private markets, uh, driving up valuations of private companies. Uh, but ironically, it's been the Magnificent Seven tech companies bidding up those, uh, those companies instead of venture capital firms, just because the tech companies have so much financial uh, firepower. So in all this, what's being missed, and, and the, most, the biggest thing is that there's going to be a massive increase in power consumption driven by all three. And unless it's clean power, then we're going to go backwards in terms of the goals for, for decarbonization. Uh, it's very hard to hit net zero when you're developing all this new technology that is very, very power intensive. Um, the computing power required for the AI learning models is substantial, and we're getting more and more press talking about the increase of data centers that will be needed to support the new industry. And the, the, you know, the reality is nobody really knows. There's some crazy numbers flying around. Um, no doubt industry will adapt. I mean, NVIDIA's new chip is less uh, energy intensive than the previous ones, so there will be some adaptation. But it's pretty clear that the increase in power consumption will be substantial. Uh, and I mean, there's, again, I won't throw on too many crazy numbers, but by 2026, a third of Ireland's uh, energy consumption will go to data centers. Uh, in the US, uh, which holds a third of data centers globally, uh, in 2022, data centers uh, consumed 4% of electricity in the US. 2026, it's estimated to be 6%, and by 2030, 10% of electricity consumed in the US will, will go to data centers, uh, and that's uh, McKinsey numbers. So what you have now is you have utilities globally scrambling around trying to figure out what is the demand forecast for energy, and the number is rapidly changing, and they're trying to figure out how do they fulfill this demand. And at the moment, the only source of clean baseload power that has been proven commercially is nuclear fission. And uh, you'll hear more about this from Guy Keller uh, later on today, I guess. Uh, but the market is in a supply deficit going forward. And with the forecast, just AI alone uh, increase in demand, the, the 2030 supply deficit in uranium, 60% of that will be made up from AI related demand. And that's assuming that nuclear maintains its role uh, providing 10% of, of global power. So in addition to the power consumption, uh, all of these big investment themes rely on upstream commodity supply. And that's not really being factored into by governments. Uh, because if you are effectively duplicating downstream capacity outside of China, then by definition, you're increasing the demand for the commodities that are needed to feed that, on that extra uh, capacity. And there's no helicopter money going upstream. Uh, for example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Lithium, Lithium Americas had a uh, $2.3 billion loan from the Department of Energy in the US. Uh, but that loan can only be used for the downstream battery grade lithium processing. It can't be used for the actual mining of the lithium. Um, and so we could use a number of different commodities in example, as, as an example. I mean, copper is the most ubiquitous. It's used in you know, all kinds of energy transition applications. But we looked at the existing demand and supply curves for copper and added on incremental 
AI demand caused by increased data centers in particular, uh, using uh, an average of investment banking uh, research. And we got the, the chart that you see there. And the base case, it's, you see, it, it includes non-committed projects that we don't know if they will actually happen. Those are the lighter blue areas on the graph. Uh, and the dotted red line is the forecast increase in copper demand from AI-related uh, data centers. And so that, that supply gap at, uh, in 2030 is about 7 million tons globally. And to put that in perspective, the world's largest copper mine is Escondida in Chile. You can see it there. Uh, and that produces about a million tons of copper. Uh, and it's run by BHP in Rio. And so you, you potentially need seven of those things to feed the increase in demand for copper alone. So if there is this problem, the question is how will the supply gaps be solved? And there's a lot of money going into new technology. And um, it's very possible we'll have some big breakthroughs on the technology side. Uh, but the reality is even the ones that do work, they will take years to be adopted commercially at scale by end users because the simple reality is when you're an end user whose business depends on a new technology, you need to be very, very sure that it's going to work before you spend the time and money and, and uh, commercial risk in implementing it. Um, and so nuclear fusion would be a good example of that. Uh, there's a lot of proponents of nuclear fusion and um, hopefully it works, but our view would be that's at least 10 years away from being commercially proven at scale by, by end users. Uh, so there is a lot of capital going into new technology solutions, and some of it will work, but it's pretty hard to hang your head on that being the, the solution in the near term. And so what if we use the current extractive industry model to fill the supply gap? Um, but unfortunately, I think as a lot of people in the room know, uh, the industry has some structural issues. And the first one is that it just keeps taking longer and longer to bring assets from discovery into production. It's currently over 15 years. And that number used to be closer to 10 years. So it's not getting any shorter. Um, and so any first year finance student can tell you that if you're pitching an investment that doesn't achieve cash flow for 16 years to an investor, that's a pretty, a pretty hard sell. Another structural issue in the market is the financing model for, for junior exploration companies. It's been funded almost solely by retail investors in public markets. Uh, about 85% of the uh, capital stack for junior companies is, is in retail hands on average. And on top of that, you have these early stage companies that go public too early. You have costs in, in management time and in being a public company that are probably not optimal for that stage of, of, of a company. Um, so we need new sources of capital for early stage resources, a sort of a venture capital type model where uh, people will be willing to take risks uh, in view of the outsized returns you get for the ones that, that work really well. And in my view, that probably needs to be led by governments and strategic end users who have the most vested interest in, in seeing that happen. But until the business metrics improve around developing assets into production, it's hard to sell that to anyone. And that's why governments need to lead the way in making the industry uh, more development or more investable in, in developing their natural resources. So the biggest thing that governments could do is to streamline the approvals and permitting process. Uh, and this is a global issue. It's, it's in every jurisdiction that is extracting resources. Uh, and one of the biggest issues is you have conflicts and overlaps between federal, state, provincial, um, other stakeholders, uh, and this duplicative process that can take longer and longer. Um, and then there also needs to be um, increased time accountability on the timeliness of approvals. Uh, and you can do all this without compromising on environmental standards. Uh, it's, it's basically a question of cutting red tape. And if that can be done and you can reduce the amount of time that it takes to develop assets, then that's just finance 101. You have uh, a much lower cost of capital for getting these projects out of the ground. Um, so governments have shown they can act very quickly in times of crisis. We saw that during COVID. Uh, and so it remains to be seen if we're approaching uh, one of those in the upstream extractive industries. 
the industry itself needs to do a better job of PR. Uh, the public is generally not aware of the good aspects of the extractive industry. Uh, they only hear the bad stories. Uh, I mean, the stat about Australian federal taxation covering the, the salaries of all the police and teachers in Australia, that's not widely known. There's dozens of countries around the world where uh, mining contributes more than 10% to GDP. Um, Australia is 10%, Indonesia is 12%, Mongolia is 20%, Chile is 15%, South Africa is 10%. Uh, and so the industry not only contributes substantial amounts of tax revenue and royalties, but it there creates high paying jobs, builds infrastructure, social infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but it's also a very old industry. I mean, typically, the industry is populated by, you know, white guys in their 50s, uh, and it needs to be made more attractive to the next generation of, of people. So then, what's the investment thesis? And we could look at a lot of things, but I think these are probably the two most impactful visuals. I mean, commodities are very cyclical by nature, um, but the chart on the left shows what an extraordinary period of time we've been operating in. That's the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index uh, against uh, the S&P 500. And um, we've seen this protracted period of outperformance uh, by the tech-led US equity markets. Uh, and it's hard to argue with the investment interest that these big tech companies are amazing companies, uh, great businesses. You can't argue with that. Uh, but given the importance of extractive industries to the economy, it simply doesn't seem right that there's such a massive difference in the top 10 uh, tech company valuations versus the top 10 battery materials valuations. I mean, the S&P 500 only has two mining companies. as Freeport, Copper Company, and Newmont Gold Company. Uh, and that's it. And so for contrarian investors, there's the very overused uh, ice hockey expression from Wayne Gretzky that you want to be where the puck's going, not where it's been. And so you, know, you can question whether big tech is where the puck's going to be going over the next five or 10 years. And we should all be reminded that the industry has shown that the sector can generate extraordinary returns in a bull market. Australia's two richest people made their fortunes developing iron ore that helped to uh, fuel China's unprecedented growth and, and development over the past few decades. Uh, and make no mistake, it wasn't easy. People had to take risks. They had to, um, in some cases, get very leveraged for periods of time and find their way out of it. Uh, but more importantly than becoming multi-billionaires personally, um, they helped create uh, wealth for the country through all the taxes and employment and development that that spurred. Uh, and from John Rockefeller in the 19th century when he became the world's first billionaire and he founded Standard Oil, it's an industry that can create tremendous amounts of wealth and outside returns. And one could argue that a combination of this energy transition decarbonization theme, uh, geopolitical onshoring, and AI tech revolution in aggregate are much bigger demand drivers than China's industrialization. And so I'm going to leave a parting thought. Um, one year ago today, uh, this man, uh, Tony, who will be presenting next, he will be presenting. And he spoke a year ago when his company was valued at um, 34 cents. And in that time, it has gone up 10 times. And uh, he looks very pleased with himself in the photo. I guess he knew something was going to happen. Uh, but they received a takeover bid from Chile's largest lithium producer and, um, and Gina Reinhart's Han Hancock prospecting, which is some food for thought given the previous slide. So for the investors in the audience, you should be spending some time over the next few days going next door, meeting the companies, talking to them about their business, and you may find your next 10 bagger as well. So thank you very much for your time. And, uh, Enjoy the rest of the, the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Oh, it was very, um, I thought it was disheartening for me to see 34 cents up to $3.62, but I certainly didn't have the, the time or the courage of my convictions to jump on board what Tony showed us last year, which is a shame. 
because I, like many people, would have been very much enriched for that particular investment. Now, I'm not going to go too much into your background. We know that you've got four decades of history in the mining industry. You've had some standout successes along the way. Andover is, I think, the one that obviously we're all going to remind, remember you for, and hopefully we'll all get a pass to your private island and your beach. That would be very, very nice. <laughs> so today, it, very fittingly, Tony is first to honour our program, and he's going to go through the history of what it's taken to get Andover to where it was, and the failures and the successes along the way, and what it's taken to create this particular mine. Would you please make him for one final time in his role as a, doing a company presentation on stage, Tony Revere representing Azure. Thank you very much, Chrissy, and also thanks to Scott uh, for these very kind words in that previous uh, presentation. It is, does give me great pleasure to actually to be able to present the Azure mineral story and, and the discovery of the Andover lithium deposit. It is a, it's a one of a kind. It's, it's quite remarkable, and I'll probably use that word many times during this presentation. Um, but it is a, an incredible discovery, and I'll take you through some of the history of that now and what it looks like and, uh, and where to from here. The usual disclaimer and statements, which can be found on the presentation and on our website. So, as Scott just mentioned, Azure Minerals is in the process of uh, a change of control transaction, where they joint venture bid by SQM, Chile's, Ch Chile's largest lithium producer, and also uh, Gina Reinhardt's Hancock Prospecting. Um, as you can see there, both of them have very large shareholdings in Azure at this stage. Um, and the change of control transaction is, is a two-stage process. Initially, there's a scheme of arrangement uh, at a price of $3.70. Um, and if that doesn't succeed, then it will go to an off-market takeover at a price of $3.65. The shareholders meeting for the scheme of arrangement to vote on that is um, just under two weeks' time. So we'll be finding out very soon as to how successful the, uh, the change of control is going to be. But at this stage, it is certainly looking very positive so that uh, share price there of $3.70 gives a, a Azure market cap of about $1.7 billion. And 12 months ago, when I stood up here, we had a market cap of under $100 million. So this is a, it's a huge uplift in terms of the value of the company. And as Scott mentioned, it's, it's well over a 10 bagger, which is it's, uh, once again, quite remarkable. Um, and it's all about the Andover project. And Andover is a joint venture between Azure and Mark Creasy and his group. It's a 60-40 joint venture. We own 60% and Mark Creasy is free carried through to the decision to mine for, for his 40%. The Andover project itself is obviously uh, lithium is the main target out there at the moment, but we actually picked the project up four years ago for its nickel, copper, cobalt potential. We did discover two nickel deposits. Um, in the first two years, and then it's more recently, it's the discovery of the lithium that's uh, been the absolute game changer. So just take you through what the project is at the moment. It's, um, it's located in the northwestern part of Western Australia. So it's in the iron ore mining districts of Western Australia. It's, as it says there, it's a heavily industrialised location with uh, all of the infrastructure you could possibly want for mining and processing operations. So our, our project is 108 square kilometres. It's shown on the slide there is that uh, blue outline. Uh, in that project area, we have high voltage power lines crossing it, gas pipeline, water pipeline. Uh, just on the left hand side to the west of it is a Rio Tinto railway line. To the south of us are all Rio Tinto's iron ore mining operations and at the coastline at the top end um, is the iron ore exporting uh, ports and facilities there. Offshore there's uh, Chevron and uh, Woodside with all of their oil and gas production facilities and then onshore on the Burrup Peninsula in the top left hand corner is the LNG processing and export facilities. So this is an area where there is an incredible amount of infrastructure already in place. And uh, for the Andover Lithium project, it, uh, it's a very, very valuable location. So if we zoom in a little bit into the project area itself, once again, the blue outline shows the three exploration licenses, which total 108 square kilometres. Just to the north of us, we've got the town of Roeburn, which has a population of about 2,000 people, and that's where our, uh, all our operations are based, so only three or four kilometres outside of the project area. It's the main highway that runs through Roeburn and then through the northern and eastern part of our project area, and then off that we have a lot of um, roads and tracks through there. Um, 
out those red shapes you can see on there, they are the uh, actual outcropping pegmatites that host in lithium mineralization. And they're in a, a swarm uh, of, a, it's like a, basically a triangular wedge. Um, and all of the pegmatites are hosted within that triangular wedge. So it's about nine kilometers east-west by up to five kilometers north-south. The areas which we've really focused on are those three white boxes, uh, tar target areas one, two, and three. Uh, very clever names that we put on those, but uh, those, those are the three areas where we've really focused our exploration up till now, and particularly the areas target one and target area three are the two target areas which have really demonstrated substantial amounts of lithium mineralization within there. So we started the drilling in March of last year. That's when we put the first drill holes into there. We've drilled now nearly 400 diamond and RC drill holes into the area for getting close to 120,000 metres of drilling in one year. It's, uh, it's a remarkable and incredible uh, achievement for, uh, for the exploration team to have defined that. And yet with all of that work, we've probably only tested maybe 40% of the targets which are in that area. So the potential here to grow that lithium deposit above and beyond what we've already uh, discovered is, is, is there and is available for us. Now, if we zoom in a little bit into target area number one, this is the first area we, we went in there and started drilling on 12 months ago. Um, there's this swarm of pegmatites, which is shown there in, in red, uh, along with all the drill holes. That, uh, that batch of uh, drilling that we've done in there extends over a uh, strike length of about 2.2 kilometres and it's lithium mineralization from bottom left from the southwest all the way up to the northeast and the mineralization remains open in those two directions and it also remains open down dip down as you go deeper towards the north the main pegmatite the main mineralized body if in this area is what we call pegmatite ap11 and ap11 is just one very large mineralized body a lot of lithium mineralization in that pegmatite true widths up to 140 meters wide which is unheard of elsewhere in the world um, good really stood high grade lithium grades in there as well and it's uh, it starts at surface and it goes all the way down to at least 500 meters vertically below surface on an angle and we look at one of the cross sections you can see there that the ap11 pegmatite is that really big red shape that's on there the width of that mineralization is uh, very substantial. And as I said, it is probably one of the only ones in the world that are like this. Mineralization starts at surface, goes down to, and it still is extending well beyond 500 meters below surface. And these are some of the drill hole intersections that we've been releasing over the last um, six to nine months since the assays first started coming in. And you can see on the uh, right hand side, the right hand column there, that is the true width. So that is how wide that body of mineralization is in actual true width. Um, and all of those intersections are well over 100 meters in, in width. And there is no other uh, lithium deposit in Australia or around the world, with the exception of one in the DRC in, in Africa, which has been getting that many plus 100 meter true width intersections. Um, this, this is really is one of a kind. And the other target area, target area three, which we've also been doing a lot of work on, a lot of drilling in there. Um, this is slightly different. This is multiple stack pegmatites all stacked on top of each other. And those pegmatites are consistently in the range of 30 to 40 metres of true width. And the, the grade is slightly higher here than it is in that first, that target area number one. Once again, the drilling has, extent, has demonstrated the mineralisation extends over two kilometres long from southwest to northeast and it extends from surface to over 400 to 500 metres below surface as well. So there's a lot more mineralisation in here. So those two targets, one, numbers one and three, are the, the, the guts of the, uh, the whole lithium deposit within the Andover project. And this is a cross section that shows some of those multiple stacked pegmatites. And here, the true widths are all in that sort of 32, basically 30 to 40 metres in true width and consistent. And those mineralised um, pegmatites that contain the lithium are just like train tracks. Over that two kilometre strike length, they just are parallel to each other and they extend consistently and, and with really good continuity throughout them. So the areas, uh, these two deposits are, uh, are very, very large. And that's what comes has um, generated 
the exploration target. Now, we publicised this exploration target in August of last year to give the market an indication as to how big the potential was for Andover to host this the lithium mineralisation. And those are those three areas, the target areas one, two and three, which make up this, this number of 100 million tonnes up to 240 million tonnes. If the combined mineral resource is 100 million tonnes, that would put it about number 11 or number 12 in the world in terms of size. If it's at the upper end of the exploration target range and it gets close to 240 million tonnes, it would make it number four in the world in terms of size. Um, so th this is potential to be absolutely huge. And so where do we go to from here? Well, the exploration target is out there, it's public, and people understand that that is the potential size of the mineralised bodies that we've got at Andover. But we also need to produce a mineral resource estimate. Um, initially, that was going to be uh, in the first couple of months of this year, but we've kept on drilling and drilling and drilling, and we keep hitting more and more lithium mineralisation. So we have extended the, uh, the time to do that, that initial mineral resource estimate out into the middle of this year. Uh, and we could still keep on going because we are still drilling and we are still hitting more and more lithium. So that initial maiden mineral resource estimate middle of this year, scoping study should be completed by the end of this year. That includes not just the resource estimate, but your mining studies, metallurgical studies, process engineering, environment, heritage, community, all of those um, components that go towards that scoping study. And the intention is to have that finished by the end of this year. And then it will be done at a very high level, so at a, a very solid level. So that will be an easy step to go from the scoping study into the feasi pre-feasibility study to a feasibility study, but get those development studies underway and, and uh, advance the project as quickly as we can. Um, and that's certainly the, the, uh, the intention of the, uh, the two bidders for the company, SQM and Hancock, as they would both like to see the project being accelerated as much as possible. So here's the timeline of what's happened in the past 12 months since I stood up here and we, we talked and all we had at that stage was we had a few rock chip samples with high lithium grades within it. So it was basic grassroots exploration at that stage. And you can see in green on the left hand side there, that's where the uh, Future Facing Commodities Conference was. It was held last year and the share price when we came here was 33 cents. Three days later it was 43 cents and there were some people in the audience who had bought shares in, those in that time and they were very, very happy, came up and saw me on the last afternoon and, and uh, basically said thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if they held on, but uh, certainly the share price has gone up a lot since then. So as you go through, the, through that timeline, you're looking at the discovery, then at the confirmation of the potential size of the project, of the deposit with the, uh, the expiration target, and then the various takeover offers or, or expressions of interest for change of control transactions were coming through from SQM and then more recently from a, a, the combined bid of SQM plus Hancock. And you can see the share price has gone all the way up to $3.70 and this is a similar slide to what Scott just showed us earlier. Basically, it's a, it's a 10 or 11 bagger. It's gone from 30 odd cents to $3.65 trading today. And if you, for example, uh, had last year invested $10,000 in, in Azure at this conference. Today, that $10,000 will be worth about $112,000. So significant uplift in, in the valuation of the company and a significant potential for uh, doing very well for the investors. And, and I will reiterate what Scott said earlier is that Azure Minerals is an example of what you can achieve if you invest in the right company. We're very fortunate, obviously, that, that this has all come off. The, out there next door, there are a lot of other companies. Now, one or two of them may also go like that for the next 12 months. So it's just a matter of an opportunity for you to get out there, talk to the, uh, the executives and the management of those teams of those companies and uh, choosing the right one. And hopefully it will go on and uh, be another big winner for you all. So this is something that um, just talk very briefly about. We could not have made this discovery if we didn't have firstly the vision to actually see the potential out there and then sell that vision to the board of directors and have the board support us to be able to take the project through all the exploration stage and into the development stage and that support is is in so many different ways it's, it's not just financial but that's an important part of it as well um, and then implementing the strategies so it's all very well to have a vision but how do you find whether that vision is true or not so you've got to implement some strategies that are going to achieve it which we were able to do successfully 
And we were also about had pulled together all of the other components that you need. So we got the right team, we gave them the right tools and the right budgets. We told them, or helped them decide which way to go in terms of uh, their exploration and the discovery. And then you just need that perseverance over and over and over again. And probably more than anything else, timing. It just needs good timing. Bring all of those things together, and if the, if the, the mineral is in the ground, then you, you've got the luck, and uh, everything comes off very nicely. So, ladies and gentlemen, this will be my last presentation for Azure Minerals. Uh, if the takeover is successful in, a, in two weeks' time, there'll be a new, new controllers in charge of the company, and I'll just ride off into the sunset and uh, having had a very, very rewarding career. And I thank you very much, everyone. Well done, Tony. Congratulations. What a great, great story and a great inspiration for us to start off today. All right. Less than a week ago, our next presenter on stage announced a CRF of $200 million for the company that he is CEO of. I'd like to welcome Brendan Harris up to the stage. Now, Brendan commented, no? Ben, is Ben coming up, is he? Yes? Do you know what's something very sad here? You're going to have to talk to me a lot, lot, um, a lot closer because there's two things have happened to me in the world of technology. You talked about things getting smaller, Scott Clements. No, don't do that. I've got things to say about you, Ben Crowley. Come on up here. <laughs> I've actually had to take off. I've got um, hearing aids after a, a diving incident about 20 years ago. I've had to take one off to do with the, the microphone here, which I've just slapped, and our audio operator will be most upset with. I've also had to take off my beautiful South Sea Pearl, Australian gold and diamond earring. So I look perhaps like a demented pirate on your stage today, but it's left me a little bit underwhelmed. All right, Ben Crowley. So you're going to talk obviously about this 200 CRF. You've got that coming up? Yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can certainly talk about that. That was impressive too. So we, you first really appeared on most of our, our investing sort of radars back with Degressa. That was three Correct. years ago yes. in WA, Correct. but you do have a plan for world domination as far as copper goes. So we mm. listen with interest to what you have to say with us. Please, please make him very welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks, Chrissy, and sorry for the late change of presenter. Um, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll introduce myself very briefly. My name is Ben Crowley. I'm the head of investor relations at Sandfire Resources. Uh, I've been with the company since around 2021. Um, prior to that, I was with Macquarie uh, for 10 years, where I was uh, an equity analyst, so working on the sell side. Um, prior to that, again, I was actually, when I had a real job, um, I was a geologist, uh, an ex exploration geologist for a number of years, um, and then also worked up in the Pilbara for a number of years as well. So um, from there, thank you to Tribeca, Argonaut, and to North Point for uh, hosting the conference and inviting us along. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you to all of you in the audience as well. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time out to come and learn a little bit more about Sandfire. Um, and of course, first, I must make that apology um, for Brendan. So Brendan, our Managing Director and CEO, who has been unexpectedly um, held back in Perth. Uh, otherwise, he would have been here and would be presenting. So he sends his apologies. Uh, so on to Sandfire. Oh, through the disclaimers, and I have to say, there are almost more disclaimers in here than there are actual slides. So uh, moving to Sandfire, it's fair to say that Sandfire is a very different company today from what it was two years ago. And um, to draw out Chrissy's point around De Grussa, it was a company that was founded on the exploration success of the discovery of the De Grussa ore bodies uh, and the very successful 10 years or so of mining um, that we, uh, we had at, at De Grussa. Um, phenomenal asset, underground, VMS style um, mineralization, uh, primarily copper with some gold in there as well. Um, but a very successful mine, uh, generated a lot of cash. Um, the company spent a long time trying to recreate that success and find another de Grusser. Um, sadly, we weren't able to achieve that and de Grusser has now transitioned into, well, to care and maintenance and now into uh, closure and rehabilitation. But needless to say, de Grusser provided really the springboard, if you like, for us 
to um, begin what we call our transformation into a global business. Uh, so we remain headquartered uh, in Perth um, with um, a relatively small team there, around about 100 professionals um, that uh, serve as the core of the business, if you like, set the standards um, that are respect expected across the business and expected to be core and common. Uh, but then really we run a very sort of uh, what the text would call an architect model um, where we uh, give the assets a lot of a high level of accountability for delivering um, on, uh, on our targets. Um, so moving from there uh, over to Spain, southern Spain, we acquired the Matza asset there, uh, a producing asset, um, bought off Traffic Euro back in 2021. Uh, we completed the tra transaction in 2021. Um, it's a very modern, or really the most modern processing hub, we believe, in the Iberian Pyrite Belt, which again is a, a, um, one of the world's preeminent uh, VMS um, systems on the, on the planet. Um, and we're currently producing around 100,000 tonnes of copper equivalent there, so that's roughly 50 to 60,000 tonnes of copper, along with another 100 to 110,000 tonnes of zinc and a little bit of uh, lead and some silver to go with that as well. Now, we're currently running at a record 4.6 million tonne throughput rate there. We have three underground mines with that one central processing uh, facility. And really over the last couple of years, it's been a um, process for us of uh, building our geological knowledge of the, of the asset, building our technical knowledge of the asset, the previous owners, um, I uh, didn't pay much attention to a lot of things that we as miners um, think are incredibly important to the success of, of mining operations. And we're really working on building consistency and credibility at Matza in those operations. Uh, moving down to, oh, pardon me. Moving down to Southern Africa and to Botswana. Um, we actually acquired uh, the Mateo project there uh, back in 2018. So prior to the Matza transaction, uh, we acquired a, uh, an exploration company called MOD, which had made a discovery at the T3 deposit. Um, and they'd moved that project to a point where it was notionally shovel ready. They had feasibility studies done, uh, permitting was well advanced, and we thought it looked like a great opportunity. So uh, we acquired that back in 2018, as I say, and, and we found that Botswana so far has been a fantastic place to operate very supportive government, um, actually ranks number 10 on the, uh, the Fraser Institute Index for Investment uh, Attractiveness. Um, so as I say, it's been a, been a great place um, to operate so far. And we managed to bring that project um, to fruition from acquiring it in 2018 to declaring commercial production on phase one of the project, which is uh, initial 3.2 million ton throughput rate. Uh, and we um, achieved, or we declared commercial production on the 1st of July in 2023. So unfortunately not going to do too much to change Scott's uh, 16 years of project delivery, um, but we think we've done rather well there. And as I'll talk about in, in, in a little bit, well, maybe uh, Matsa has also um, uh, delivered new ore bodies in a very short period of time. The Magdalena deposit there, which is one of the key, one of the three mines, um, was uh, discovered in 2015 and was in production in 2018. So um, it can be done, albeit on a relatively small scale, and I think probably talks um, very much to jurisdiction and the importance of jurisdiction and being in the right place uh, with, as I've said, supportive governments, with um, permitting processes that can be navigated. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and so we, um, uh, I'm very pleased with how things are going in Botswana at Mateo. So I mentioned that the initial phase was 3.2 million tonnes. Uh, we discovered the A4 deposit, um, it, which is around eight kilometres away from the processing facility and the T3, um, the T3 deposit. Uh, we discovered that whilst we were um, finalising the study works. So we actually expanded the project before we'd even reached the final investment decision on it. Uh, so we're now ramping that up. Uh, to 5.2 million tonnes, which um, is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate throughput rate there. Um, and uh, that is, um, again, going 
rather well for us. We're quite pleased with that. We have seen uh, on a daily basis um, throughput pushing up towards 6 million tonnes. So hopefully there's a little bit more for us to squeeze out of that as well. Uh, and then just over here in, in Montana, uh, in the US, uh, we have the Black Butte project. Um, we own that. We're the majority owner, 87% owner of TSX listed Sandfire America. Um, and we have ownership of the project through that. There's been a legal challenge, again, talking to jurisdiction. There's been a legal challenge to the permit of the pro, uh, project. Permit was, was issued some years ago. Um, we've been navigating through that legal process and we have um, recently been told that we uh, that the Montana Supreme Court has voted in favour um, of us on all counts there, um, and we now have a pathway to production. So where does all that leave us? Uh, so in the short term, 50% growth in copper equivalent production uh, out to FY25. Now that's primarily driven by Matteo, um, but over and above that, we believe uh, that we have opportunities to grow MPV uh, on a per share basis, of course, because that's um, ultimately what we're here for, is to grow value for our share or increase value for our shareholders, uh, and doing that by uh, terming out our reserves, by extending our mine life at our two um, operations. Uh, and this really goes, I think, to the heart of the um, Sandfire investment proposition, and that is to term out those reserves at Matza. Uh, we currently have a mine life around eight years, uh, at Mateo, nine or 10 years on current reserves. And what we are working on at the moment is a three to five year plan uh, to increase uh, the reserves in front of us uh, to around 15 years. So that means replacing obviously depletion over those three to five years as we work out and, and, and drill out the targets, which I'll show you uh, just now. Um, so ultimately looking to have something like 20 years uh, in front of both of those. And really this is again part of this, the Sandfire strategy um, is to establish, uh, to establish processing hubs in areas that we think have regional prospectivity um, and then to build out from that point. So turning to Mateo, um, as you can see here, uh, we have the T3 open pit and the processing plant down here, A4 approximately eight kilometres away, uh, 20 kilometres or so away, we have the A1 um, project, uh, much like Tony, um, our geologists aren't particularly um, uh, imaginative when it comes to um, naming targets and, all, uh, and ultimately ore bodies. So what we're doing here uh, is that we have a drill program at A4 where we believe that we can extend mineralisation there by approximately one to two years. Uh, we also have footwall extensions at T3, which we are currently drilling. Um, and I'm told this morning that we have intersected mineralisation there um, and no better place to find additional mineralisation than in the footwall of your, your pit where just steepening up the, the pit wall uh, should hopefully yield um, additions to mine life. So we think we might have another one to two years there. And then A1, pardon me, we recently completed a initial resource drill out there and should have a maiden resource for that coming in the next quarter or so. And we believe that should yield a similar one to two years worth of additional mine life. So overall, that really taking Mateo up to from 10 years now, hopefully that gives us a start on getting up to the sort of 13, 14 year range in terms of mine life. And then beyond that, we have a very large regional package, much larger than this. This is just the mining lease around the, uh, around the mine. Um, but we have exploration ground, which runs from near Maun up here, uh, some 250 kilometers down to the Namibian border, um, and is a place that we think is, is very prospective for additional discoveries. Uh, turning to Matza. Um, really here it's about a, a change in, in view, a change in oh, maybe perspective is a better way of putting it and taking a longer term view really based around the well-known longevity of the Iberian pyrite belt uh, and, and that's in contrast to uh, the previous owner that had a, a much shorter term view um, and really operated the asset for the benefit of their downstream business. Uh, so one of the key opportunities that was identified by our team during the due diligence for the transaction was the value that improved ore body knowledge could deliver. 
and the team over the last two years have been working on that and we've seen some very early success. There's still an awful lot more work to be done, uh, but we've certainly seen some early success and if you like what, what we like to think of uh, as proof of concept in their reinterpretation. So the guys, went, guys and girls went back, re-logged, reinterpreted, um, and extracted a lot of additional information, metallurgical information, lithological information from the core library um, and turn that into a, a holistic reinterpretation of the mineralized, mineralized system. Um, and that yielded, as I say, very early success. Uh, we discovered this at Planview here at San Pedro. This is the Aguas Tanitas mine, all the underground infrastructure there. Uh, and some 100 to 150 meters away, uh, the guys discovered the San Pedro zone. We currently have mineralization there um, uh, defined over around 700 meters of strike uh, with another 1.8 kilometers of strike um, to go. So uh, overall, we think that represents a, a, maybe a 15 to 20 million ton opportunity, um, which uh, Matt's are producing at, let's call it uh, uh, 5 million tons a year or thereabouts, uh, obviously starts to build on that thematic of pushing out our reserve life. Then at uh, Olivo, this is at Magdalena, the other of the two northern mines, uh, Massa Olivo in here, an area that was previously thought to be void uh, or, or devoid of mineralization, I should say. Um, reinterpretation changed that view. Um, it was drilled and we discovered mineralization there. And uh, so the key target for us, uh, in addition to the, uh, the, the strike length here at San Pedro, is this large EM plate that we generated off a downhole survey done off this hole here. This is currently being re-drilled. Um, this target, this hole actually missed the mineralization or what, what we, the mineralized horizon, uh, but we're drilling following up with that and we hope to have results on that in the very near future. So in summary, 50% production growth uh, from here out till FY25, the end of FY25, as I say, driven by the ramp up of Mateo. Uh, two modern processing hubs with very large regional scale expo exploration potential. Um, and also, I haven't really spoken about this, but seem to be ex capex as well, importantly. So, really moving into that cash flow harvesting or cash flow generating, generating pardon me, um, uh, phase. Um, and then that three to five year plan to push out the reserves further and to continue that story. So that's for me. Thanks, Chrissy. Well done, ben, Thank you all. Now, I didn't uh, mention the rules of engagement for the presenters on stage, Benjamin. I'm sure Brendan should have passed that information on to you. I will stand at one minute and I'll stand right next to you when I need to push you off the stage. So let yes. that be a warning to everyone else. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks for stepping in. It was a really engaging presentation. So uh, to all of our presenters who are in the room, I will be ringing my bell at two minutes from this point. I'll be standing up at one minute and I'll be standing particularly close to you when it is the end of your presentation because we've got a, a lot of fair crack of um, presentations to get through today. And we are running a little bit behind, but it's all been very, very interesting, including the next presentation. Now, when I was doing the deep dive for all the presenters for this conference, I got to the bit about our first keynote presenter and I went, Bugger, I've just picked up this book from the bookstore, you know, as you go through the airport. I thought it looked interesting. But then I read about your book. And I thought, geez, this is really, for something that I thought would be fairly dry, um, the more I read into the, all of the, 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 um, uh, the reviews on it, I thought, I wonder when I see him if this gentleman's going to have bodyguards. Because the things that you've written about and the insights that you have in some of the people who are behind this uh, energy transition, I think would make you a target for some people. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I please introduce you to Henry Sanderson. He is the author of Vault Rush, and I'm very much looking forward to this keynote, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a real honor to present here today and talk a bit about my book and a bit about how I see developments uh, since my book and, and the geopolitics um, that we see going on around us um, all the time. Uh, so this is my book, Vault Rush. Um, it covers the, the supply chain of, of batteries and some of the history and some of the geopolitics. 
I'd like to start today uh, with a bit of the history, because I think it's important to remember um, how long clean energy technologies have been around. I don't know if anyone recognizes uh, this man. This is Thomas Edison. He's one of the most, uh, was one of the most prolific uh, American inventors. When we think of Edison, we probably think of, of this, the light bulb amongst his many other uh, inventions. But in the book, I argue that we should think about him in terms of batteries, because uh, Edison actually spent many years of his life and millions of his own money trying to, to invent a, a better battery. And he did succeed in coming out with the nickel iron alkaline storage battery. And we all know this man, uh, Henry Ford, the greatest um, automotive tycoon um, of, of the 20th century. Uh, but not many people know his wife actually drove an electric at the time. This is a Detroit electric, which was uh, very popular with, with women. And Ford and Edison teamed up to try and create an electric vehicle. And this is the only photo of this prototype um, in the Ford archives. And you can see Edison's batteries um, under, the, under the seat. And over 100 years ago, electric vehicles became incredibly close to, uh, you know, to, to succeeding. Uh, this is a graph showing a number of models, number of producers, and real prices. Electric vehicles are in green, black uh, gasoline, and red steam. And you can see in all these metrics, um, you know, electric vehicles uh, came, came very close. So it's one of those real historical uh, what-if uh, moments. And what's so interesting about it is, at the time, people thought electrics could be used for inner city transport, and there was even a company um, in New York that sort of leased uh, electric vehicles. But fossil fuels took over every mode of, of transport, um, and EVs were consigned um, to, the, to the dustbin, essentially. And uh, if you look at other clean energy technologies, this is one of the first windmills, uh, wind turbines used to generate electricity. This is 1888, Charles Brush, Brush uh, in America built this, built this wind turbine in, in his backyard and it charged a number of batteries um, in, in his laboratory in his basement. A year earlier in Scotland, James Blythe also developed a wind turbine to, to generate electricity. So these are really quite old uh, technologies that have taken us a long time. Uh, one of the unfortunate things is, after that initial burst of enthusiasm, as I said, fossil fuels took over every form of transport. We entered the oil age and the geopolitics um, of the oil age, which I argue my book sort of left a long scar over the 20th century. And we saw um, you know, a number of uh, geopolitical implications, the, the rise of the Middle East, um, but now we're entering the, the clean energy age, finally, after many, many years. And I'm very interested in the geopolitics of this clean energy age. And in the book, I look at um, one of the key technologies, uh, which, is, which is batteries. Because uh, if you're talking about uh, replacing the two billion cars on the road, we're going to need a lot of batteries. If you're talking about energy storage, helping intermittent renewable energy integrate into the grid, we're also going to need um, a lot of batteries. So today I'll just briefly talk about three things that I think are important. You know, this energy transition is creating new winners and losers. This is happening very, very quickly, uh, much quicker than I thought. Um, why raw materials are the key bottleneck. This is something uh, where I work now, benchmark mineral intelligence, we, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at. And, and third, what happens to costs when you reshore some of these supply chains at a time of high inflation? Uh, since my book came out, we've seen uh, this issue come to the very top of the political agenda and real efforts to try and localize and reshore these supply chains. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. So just first, the new winners and new losers. We're seeing all sorts of countries become very important in terms of clean energy and clean energy supply chains. Um, you know, I list some of them in, in, in this list. Um, Australia, obviously, for, for the minerals, Canada, uh, likewise, Indonesia for, for the nickel. Um, countries like Democratic Republic of Congo for the cobalt they have, uh, Chile and Argentina for lithium, um, Europe and, uh, and Sweden as well. I was just recently in Sweden and there's a lot of activity there around battery production, anode um, production and, and sodium ion batteries. But at the heart of this transition is the China and the US and the relationship between these two uh, superpowers. And in many senses, a lot of these other countries are trying to find their, their place um, in this new, what's been called a new Cold War between China and the US. 
Do they try to hedge themselves um, between these two, two countries or do they align uh, fully with the US? We've seen Canada take steps to uh, you know, forcibly expel Chinese companies from investment in Canadian lithium and really align with the US efforts to promote new supply chains. Um, Australia also has, has done that. Uh, but countries like Indonesia, Argentina, Chile, they're much more, uh, you know, they're much more open to Chinese investment and, and supplying uh, China. And for a lot of developing countries, the China-US uh, sort of conflict, they, they don't necessarily see that as their conflict. They uh, want the benefits of the energy transition, they want the jobs, economic development, um, but they would much rather the West spends uh, money helping them combat climate change, helping them develop their economies rather than, uh, you know, help the US and China um, essentially fight each other and uh, try to uh, disentangle their, their economies. So when we look at the battery supply chain, um, it goes all the way from extraction to the electric vehicle. But the crucial thing is there's a number of steps um, in between. And as Scott mentioned earlier, developing a new mine, um, I put at the bottom the time scales. Um, you know, he said 15 years, um, it can take longer. So there's a fundamental mismatch between the time it takes to develop the mines and then the other steps in the supply chain. In China now, they can build um, chemical processing, cathode and battery cell manufacturing in, in about a year, um, actually much quicker than I put here. Um, so they can really build these plants extremely quickly, um, but it's the mines that is the sort of limiting factor in terms of time, um, time it takes to, uh, to develop them. Uh, battery demand obviously was around uh, one terawatt hour, I think last year. Um, it's going to more than triple uh, this decade, but you can really see um, how electric vehicles are really going to be the dominant driver of, of lithium ion battery demand. Um, and this is quite key when you think about new technologies, especially energy storage technologies that might offer uh, great uh, you know, potential different materials. Um, but can they compete on costs with the EV batteries because of the sheer scale of battery production um, that's going to electric vehicles? Uh, longer term, you know, we're looking at you know, hundreds of terawatt hours that we need for this energy transition to get to net zero. I think Elon Musk says, says around 200 uh, to 300 terawatt hours, um, so 20 terawatt hours a year. Um, that's a sort of longer term view, but it gives you an idea of the scale of, of battery production that we need from one terawatt hour up to uh, 20 terawatt hours. And the implications on raw materials are really quite uh, significant. Uh, with lithium, you know, around 12 million tons, um, up from around 1 million tons at the moment. Uh, so we're really in the early stages of this energy transition. Um, and the sheer scale of, as I said, those 2 billion cars on the road, and then you add in the energy storage demand um, as well. We did a rough calculation of benchmark, taking the average mine size, how many mines would you need? Uh, it's over 300 new mines to, to meet demand by 2035. Um, and, and the interesting thing is by 2035, even if you take recycling into account, there's not that much um, difference. We do need these, these new mining assets. Um, as we come to later in the decade, we are gonna see shortages in lithium, nickel, and, and cobalt. So we need, if you take into account how long it takes to build these mines, we need that investment now uh, to get that supply at the end of the decade. Uh, just talking about China's dominance, I think it's really key to stress where, where China is dominant and, and where it's not. China is really um, extremely dominant on the processing side and the cathode and nano production and battery cell production. But the raw materials is actually still very reliant on imports like it is for oil and, uh, oil and gas. Um, so if you think of China's perspective, um, they need to secure these raw materials outside their borders, yet they face an increasingly hostile world. As I said, Canada has stopped Chinese companies from investing in lithium, and we're probably going to see uh, more of the same. Um, so they need these raw materials to feed the other sectors, the industrial sectors that, that provide the jobs um, and economic opportunity in, in, in China. Um, so that's why we do see Chinese investment in African lithium, uh, lithium in Argentina, um, etc. And also the development of domestic lithium within China. Um, you know, China is really thinking of energy security, as is Europe and, and the US. So for them, a combination of uh, coal, which they have uh, domestically, coal plus renewables, uh, charging um, electric vehicles will help them reduce their, uh, their oil um, import. So whatever they can do to, to get more raw materials, 
um, they, they need that. And likewise, flipping it around for the West, um, where we are really vulnerable is the processing side and the cathode and anode um, side, whereas the mines, uh, you know, Australia is obviously a key Western ally um, and Canada has mines, but it's really these other steps that are energy intense, um, require a lot of technical expertise, um, and are very difficult to compete with China on cost that are, that are the West's vulnerability. Um, you know, and China has what I would call excessive dominance in some areas. Uh, rare earths and rare earth magnets is one, but anode and graphite is another. I think this is receiving more attention now. But if you look at sort of anode capacity uh, being built and, and forecast to be built, China's dominance is, is set to remain um, throughout this decade into the early part of, of next decade. Um, so I think if the West wants to de-risk, it should really focus on these areas where China's dominance is 90 plus percent. And, and the West can, can de-risk to slightly reduce that dominance, um, rather than focusing on areas where China is only 50% um, of the market. It's really anode um, and rare earths where, where China is really highly dominant. Uh, this is a, a picture of Xi Jinping visiting a cathode plant in Hunan recently. Um, it was his first visit after the National People's Congress. Um, and I think it really signifies to me how China and how Xi is going to continue to support um, those areas where China has, uh, has dominance and really put its um, you know, pedal to the metal uh, to increase um, those areas. They fit perfectly into his view of new productive forces, um, high-tech manufacturing. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised in the West um, you know, that China will respond to our efforts to de-risk, our efforts to uh, reduce reliance on, on China, and they will continue to expand investment and uh, capacity. If you look at another area where China is dominant, uh, PCAM, which is the um, you know, precursor material. So once you've processed the materials, you need to uh, produce PCAM before it goes into the cathode. Again, we see China 90, 90% um, capacity out to 2035. Uh, so this is yet another area where, where China's dominance is, is really extreme. Um, and China has not only uh, become dominant, it's, it's over-invested. And we've seen this year um, a lot of uh, plants being idle or underutilized. But if you look at something like LFP cathode, there's massive overcapacity, and China could afford to supply um, the entire world with LFP um, cathode materials. So this is really putting pressure on prices just at the time when the West is trying to de-risk and trying to build its own uh, supply chain. You can see LFP prices, prices for LFP cathode material have, have fallen uh, quite significantly. So good news for electric vehicles, but makes it more difficult for the West to, um, to de-risk. Um, longer term, you know, we, we think raw materials are important. As I said, they're one of the key bottlenecks because we still see um, NCM batteries, nickel cobalt manganese batteries playing a significant role for longer range vehicles, uh, for premium vehicles, and for markets like the US where, where people want uh, more range. So we do see, uh, you know, despite the rise in LFP, that we will see um, both chemistries maintaining uh, dominance. And this has huge implications for countries like Indonesia, which, as I said earlier, is, is, is very dominant in nickel. Uh, they're going to play a really key role um, this decade. Yeah, U.S. back in the game. I'll just talk a bit about the Inflation Reduction Act and, and how significant a piece of legislation this is. Um, this wasn't in my book. It came out after my book was published. But, you know, growing up, you know, we became so used to the U.S. never doing anything when it came to climate legislation. And Obama had very similar goals in terms of stimulating clean energy technologies in the U.S., getting the jobs from the energy transition. Um, but he couldn't quite manage to, uh, to get Congress to pass legislation. So the IRA is extremely significant. Not a single Republican vote, but they still managed to get this uh, legislation passed. Um, and what we see um, in the IRA is very protectionist measures and very, um, you know, very similar to how China has uh, developed its clean energy industries. So it's like the US trying to, trying to do a China, trying to outdo China. Um, and in particular, this is when it comes to critical minerals, um, you can get the 3,750 uh, tax credit, you know, so when someone buys an EV, they can get money off the EV purchase price. Um, but the, e the materials have to be mined or processed in uh, North America or free trade agreement countries. Um, and more significantly, they introduced a rule saying foreign entities of concern uh, cannot be involved in this uh, supply chain. 
um, China being the most significant entity of concern. And they further defined this as uh, a foreign entity of concern is a, a company where 25% um, or more is owned by a company linked to the state of uh, Chinese state or, or government or based in uh, China. And this really um, you, you know, brings to the heart the, the challenges of localizing these supply chains because uh, many countries are not, don't have FTAs with the US. Um, and in addition, um, the, the rule on foreign entity of concern is a rule that the US can't really win uh, because it either creates loopholes that they can be accused of uh, using taxpayer funds to, to, to be, uh, benefit China, um, or they're too strict and not enough EVs get the tax credit, therefore defeating the very objective of, of Biden's um, rule. So here you can see why. I mean, when, you, when it comes to nickel, you know, we forecast only 13% IRA compliant, 73% coming from Indonesia, China, and, and uh, uh, Russia. And um, if you look at uh, cobalt supply, it's, it's very similar, 83% um, um, you know, DRC, um, and Indonesia is becoming a big producer. So, so countries without an FTA with, with the US. Um, and if you look at the processing side, um, nickel sulfate, um, you know, most of it, it would be classed as foreign energy concerns or processed within China. Um, and cobalt, uh, the same uh, process, process within, uh, within China. Um, when it comes to lithium, similarly, while lithium is extracted in South America, Australia, China really has uh, quite a dominant portion of the processing. But within that portion, a lot is owned or invested in by uh, American companies, um, such as Albemarle or Liven, or now what's uh, called Arcadium Lithium. And those assets, because they're within China, would, would count as a foreign entity of concern, even though they're invested by, by an American company. And the cost difference is, is huge. Um, Arcadium Lithium said uh, they built lithium processing in China uh, for $20 million for a new plant. And they said in the US that would cost $200 million. So we can see a 10 times uh, cost difference. And we're seeing um, at, at the same time as uh, these uh, FTA, these IRA restrictions coming in, that the costs are increasing for a lot of projects in, in the West. Um, so, how do we compete with China? I'll just offer a few thoughts. Um, I do think innovations that are low cost and, and more sustainable are, are the way to go. We can't have innovations that, that add to the costs. We need to have innovations that can somehow cut the costs of processing or enable the West to have some sort of um, cost advantage. Um, using hydropower, using renewable energy um, can help to, to lower the carbon footprint and potentially cut costs. Um, and government subsidies, of course, we need to see um, some sort of political continuity to maintain the support uh, for this sector and somehow make sure it's not um, vulnerable to electoral cycles or domestic um, politics. And I think that's, that's really key. Eventually, we could create new supply chains where, unlike now, where everything goes to China, everything's shipped to China and electric vehicles are shipped back to, to Europe. Uh, we could see minerals from Australia go to Europe to be processed or from elsewhere. Um, so that's sort of the vision and, and the hope, um, but it's not going to be easy to, to get there. A techn technological innovation, as I said, something like direct lithium extraction could improve the yield, improve the uh, efficiency of lithium extraction, but also unlock lithium in North America or other areas that, again, could, could help the West um, build, up, build up these supply chains. Um, you know, I talked about government subsidies being important. What we're also seeing is friend shoring and the idea that countries can come together to compete with, with China. Um, it's, not, it's not as simple as it sounds. And, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act caused a lot of backlash in Europe. And a lot of investments that were going to be made in Europe have gone to the US. Um, so there, is, there are tensions um, in this arrangement. But this, I think, is, is a way to, uh, a strategy to pursue because if all these countries get together, um, there is enough to, there to create new supply chains um, and really focus on, um, focus on the task. And real money is starting to come out to mining. I think Scott mentioned earlier the DOE loan to Lithium Americas for lithium processing. But this is big money, right? This is real money. Um, Australia has also given recent loans to, to Liontown Resources and uh, 
rare earths uh, company as well. So we're seeing real money come out for the first time into these, into these projects. And I talked about clean energy, hydropower. Quebec is another area that's becoming a cluster um, due to the low carbon footprint of, of its hydropower. There is, um, there is um, sorry, just talk about this a bit, which is another thing that needs to happen is somehow for markets to reward the, the carbon footprint of Western production or more sustainable uh, production. We're not there yet. At the moment, automotive companies won't pay a premium for, for more sustainable um, supply or, or battery production. But I think eventually um, we could, could get to a situation where a slight premium um, emerges. Um, and that's the kind of thing that would also help drive um, Western uh, build out of, of supply chains. Um, and recycling as well. If you, if you think about it at the moment, China's exporting all these lithium ion batteries uh, and EVs to, to Europe and, and, and the US. Um, they are, in essence, giving us these materials um, that have been processed in China um, that we can then use and, and recycle. So if we can keep hold of the batteries that, that we import and the EVs that are within Europe, um, then we can, we can get a hold of um, quite significant uh, resources in the future, um, 2030s plus. In addition, as we build out these supply chains, we're going to generate a huge amount of process scrap, um, you know, waste scrap from all these gigafactories that we can also use in, in the near term. And we forecast 78%, I think, by 2025 will come from this process scrap um, uh, from gigafactories. Uh, final, final thought also is, do we use this energy transition to, to rethink mobility, think about how we, um, how we get around? Are we going to choose the uh, Ford F-150 pickup truck on the left, which has a big nickel heavy battery, um, or the Wuling Mini on the right, um, which uses no nickel and cobalt and much less um, lithium. You know, if you, if you had smaller battery pack sizes, you could potentially avert the whole lithium deficit. This is um, an exercise that we did. So that's really um, powerful, especially for Europe, where you do see mini electric vehicles and you do see SUVs, you see all variety. Um, if you build out the charging infrastructure, um, then we can try to enable smaller cars with, with smaller battery packs. Um, China's really cracked that mass market smaller EVs. And I think Europe and the US, what we need to see is that mass market electric vehicle. As Elon Musk has said, we're between these two waves uh, where the next stage is mass market cheap um, EVs. And we need to get consumers um, to accept them and to, um, and to, and to support them. Um, so, so just in conclusion, I think you know, we're well on our way to this energy transition, but I do think the geopolitics and the politics um, domestically uh, are really of, of high concern and are worth um, following um, closely um, because we need to, in Western democracies, we need to get buy-in from populations for this project of de-risking from China and building out these supply chains. And we need to get um, the public uh, support um, because we're already seeing, because China is so dominant, we're already seeing uh, voices coming out against EVs um, because they say it will lead us to um, reliance on, on China. So we're in a very dangerous um, area where in the West we need to maintain um, this vision and this strategy that we've embarked on and, and not give up. So thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Very interesting. Make sure you grab a copy of that book because it's definite, uh, definitely recommended reading. All right, Nickel, taken a bit of battering recently. They're predicting a US $200 million um, hit financially. Many reasons for that, and I'll leave it to our presenters to go through them with you. What was interesting, I thought, was when you look at some of what the off-takers and OEMs are looking for, they are citing uh, Nickel with lower emission intensity where they could source that. So. Centura, so I'm sure we'll be able to come up with the goods there over in Brazil at their, their Jaguar project. Things are certainly heading that way. Their ESG credentials are at the front there. And this fellow here is uh, Darren Gordon. Excuse me, Darren, I'm slow. And Darren is going to take us through this opportunity for us. Would you please make him welcome, everyone? Thanks very much, Chrissy. Uh, thanks to the sponsors and a great pleasure to be here today to present the Centaurus Metals story. Um, it comes at a time at a, a bit of an interesting time in the market. Backdrop of nickel hasn't been great over the last little while, particularly Australian listed companies that have been sort of exposed to what's 
been happening in the nickel sulphide space in country. Today I'd like to try to demonstrate that Centaurus is a little bit different to that, um, that we should be able to compete on a cost basis uh, with the Indonesian supplier and that we can do that with a very low carbon footprint. Uh, the disclaimers are on our website and obviously in the presentation. So when you look at Centaurus, um, we're trying to build a strategic mineral business in Brazil. Um, and that's central uh, at the moment around our nickel project called Jaguar. It does have an extremely low carbon footprint. We put some uh, new data out today, um, just demonstrating where that is, and I'll talk to that in a sec. Um, we are looking to be a 20,000 tonne a year producer and do that over a long period of time. We have a large resource. It's nearly a million tonnes of contained nickel metal, and we are located in the Karajas mineral province where you have an enormous amount of infrastructure, uh, principally built up by Vale over the last 50 years. So Jaguar was a project we acquired from Vale about four years ago. Um, we've completed about 150,000 metres of diamond core drilling ourselves and about another 40,000 metres of RC drilling. So we're well on our way with this project, um, looking at completing a feasibility study by the end of June. Just briefly touching on the corporate side of it, um, and I guess just for investors here, just focusing on the, the market cap, um, that has come back a long way over the last 12 months with what's happened in the nickel market and uh, what's happened in the Australian sector in particular. Um, the feasibility study that we will put out will hopefully allay any concerns about where our project is and demonstrate huge value um, when we can do that. We do have a reasonable amount of cash, so we're well funded. We don't need to come back to the market. We are well covered by the analysts in Australia, and we have a very solid uh, shareholder base, principally through family offices and high net worths. Great experience on the board. Uh, all facets of our business are covered, so we feel like we're well placed to be able to take Jaguar through to the next phase. Now, I don't want to touch on the market too much. Henry is obviously much better equipped to do that than I. But one thing I did want to point out is that the demand for nickel, we believe, is not going away. And if you look at what's got to happen into the US and European markets in particular, where nickel will probably be a bigger part of the battery composition than anywhere else, there's a huge amount of nickel that still needs to come onto the market. If you roll out to 2040, there's basically another 85 Jaguar mines that need to be identified that can produce at least 20,000 tonnes a year of, of nickel. Um, those green dots on the page on the, on the map of the US and the map of Europe are all, uh, I guess, planned gigafactories that are looking to have nickel as part of their key chemistry. So when you look at what's happened in recent times and where the uh, supply demand balance has gone, uh, we think that that is temporary. We do think that Indonesia's supply is real and will continue to be very real against the market backdrop. But there is going to need to be a lot more nickel supply coming on stream to be able to meet the market. Um, and I think that will come with higher incentive prices to uh, bring back uh, nickel supply online. This morning we released an updated, uh, I guess, emissions footprint of where we think our project will be. Um, at 7.27 tonnes of carbon per tonne of nickel, that is going to be extremely low on the emissions curve for all nickel production. Um, that picks up all of your class one, all of your class two, nickel pig iron, ferro nickel, HPAL and sulphide projects. At our mine itself will be about one and a half tonnes of carbon uh, per tonne of nickel, principally driven by the fact that our supply of power will be 100% renewables and that we have a very low um, I guess, uh, carbon uh, costs associated with the mining activities. This picks up all of the downstream um, of where our product will go, targeting to put this into the Atlantic basin, into that market that I've just talked to, uh, that's going to be crying out for more nickel supply. So just looking at Brazil in particular, um, it's a great place to operate. We've been there now for 15 years. Um, we have a very good handle on what we need to do. Uh, there's a very clear tenement system, expiration licenses to mining leases. We've made our mining lease applications and they have been approved from a technical perspective. From an environmental perspective, the process is well understood, clear terms of reference. Um, again, we have lodged our environmental impact assessment, which has been approved. 
Um, so the first steps to getting our project up and running from a licensing um, point of view have been met. Um, interestingly, there's a 15% uh, tax rate for the first 10 years on these projects because we are based in the Karajas. Um, they are obviously looking to develop this area more and more. Um, but the biggest, I think, sell to the whole uh, of Brazil and what it can do for the supply of critical minerals into the world market is the fact that its power is coming off the grid already at about 80% renewables. But if you're big enough and you've got enough uh, need for power, then you can get to 100% uh, renewable power source like Centaurus can. So looking where we are, as it's touched upon, um, it's a, a part of the world that's dominated by Vale. They've been there for a long time. There might be some deposits there that you've heard of called Salobo, largest copper deposit in Brazil, uh, S11D, largest iron ore mine in the, on the globe right now. So when you have this, uh, I guess, development, you have rail, you have sealed roads, you have high voltage power, and you've got a ready-made workforce that's already been established there for at least two, probably three generations now. We're close to a town called Tukuma and Orlanja de Norch. They're both about 35,000 people each. So we've got ready-made workforce. There's a, a Canadian company called Aero Copper that is building a copper flotation plant very close to where our project will be. Um, so there's a lot of development already going on here. There's no reason why the Jaguar Nickel uh, sulfide project doesn't get up and running. You can see from the, the Google image there that, you know, it's principally farmland. Um, there's no real impediments to getting a project started in this part of the world. I'm just touching upon some of the infrastructure you see there, obviously the big dams for the hydro systems, uh, the port where we'll be looking to export from called Villa de Congi. Um, and a couple of photos there of the Aero Copper operation, which is looking to commission probably in uh, June or July this year. Um, it really just shows what's, what the opportunity is and the fact that we can bring a project like Jaguar together. The resource is nearly a million tonnes of contained nickel metal. Um, we do think it's one of the best undeveloped nickel sulphide projects globally. Um, it is going to be open pitable um, probably for the first 15 years of its life, as can be supported by the measured and indicated component of the resource. Um, so a very large proportion of our overall resource has been drilled out very extensively. Um, those pits there coalesce into one. They're about three kilometres of strike with a couple of satellites in the north. Um, but as I said, for right at this point in time with the feasibility study, all the focus is on the open pit. We're not talking about anything in the underground, but we do know that we will have an underground development here at some point in time in the future. You can see from the drilling, um, this, the all bodies here are vertical, sub-vertical zones of mineralisation. Um, we've drilled down to about a thousand metres deep. We've still continued to hit mineralisation there. Uh, those sort of intersections are not in our resource yet. Uh, probably the deepest drill hole that's gone into the resource is around 500 metres deep. Uh, so we do see that the next Jork resource that we put out will have a fairly significant uplift in the overall mineral resource, albeit it won't impact the feasibility study that we're completing now, given that that's principally on the open pit mineralisation. When you look at Jaguar in the context of you know, global nickel camps, um, there's a number of very large deposits in North America and Canada that are relatively low grade. There's a number of deposits in Australia that are deeper, higher grade underground deposits, whereas we've got the best of both worlds. We've got open pitable, relatively high grade nickel sulphides. And you know you can see the center of page there that Jaguar is sitting quite comfortably with a number of the major uh, nickel belts that have been discovered over the, the past. Um, so we feel very fortunate to have this deposit and to be able to bring this to market. The feasibility study is being completed now, having that uh, to come out in June, uh, very a high level schematic of what it's going to look like. You can see the pits in the background with the tailings dam, uh, typical nickel flotation plant there. Uh, the mining work's been done. Uh, the capital and operating cost estimate, estimation is coming together now. So it's really all of the final touches of pulling the feasibility study together, which hopefully will demonstrate to the market at large, that the market cap that the company
company now has is well under where it should be relative to the value that this project can deliver. There's nothing complex about the flow sheet. It's a very traditional nickel flotation plant. It's been done many times before. Um, we have simplified this project in recent uh, months, just trying to pull it back from what was originally going to be a sulphate project. Um, but we obviously didn't want to take off, take on too much in our own right, um, whilst uh, nickel market conditions weren't overly conducive for a junior trying to build very large capital projects. So we're focusing on a nickel flotation plant to produce a nickel concentrate, which we'll look to put into the market. As I touched upon a little bit earlier, the approval side of things is coming along really well. I think sometimes Brazil gets a bad rap for um, the approval process and how long it takes. I actually think it's, we can get through these approval processes probably quicker than a lot of places, um, particularly some of these free trade agreement countries that sit inside um, the IRA legislation. So we've had our environmental impact assessment approved. So we've had what they call a preliminary license already issued. We've had the technical approval of our mining leases already granted. Um, to get the final issue of the mining lease, we need the second stage of the environmental approval, which is what they call an installation license, which we should have by September or October this year. Um, that preliminary license really was the uh, the largest part of the process, so we feel very fortunate to have all of that in place. We've got the team on the ground in Tukuma. Uh, there's a number of other aspects of uh, our ESG credentials that are being sort of uh, fostered in the local community, and we do a very good job of talking with those local communities and supporting jobs locally. So the feasibility study should come out by the end of June. Um, we'll be looking to make an investment decision in the early part of, of next year that's going to be reliant on the uh, the approvals, the mining lease and the uh, preliminary, uh, sorry, the installation license and then obviously having our financing all lined up. Um, probably a 18 month to uh, 20 month construction window and then hopefully first production uh, through the middle of 2027. Just briefly touch upon one of the other projects that we've got because we are looking at strategic metals in Brazil, a um, project called Boi Novo, very close to Paropeba, still in that Carajás mineral province. Early days, Greenfields project, uh, we're about to drill that probably towards late April. Uh, all the early stage geophysical work is demonstrating some very nice targets. But why I guess I emphasise this is that uh, whilst Jaguar is definitely the focus of our attention, um, we do have exceptional skills to being able to develop new projects, new critical mineral projects in Brazil. We'll look to foster our relationship with Vale to open up new opportunities uh, in a similar way that we were able to pick up the Jaguar process project in the first place. So we've got to focus on strategic minerals in Brazil. Um, that's always been the case. I think that will be the case for some period of time, but Jaguar itself has a very low carbon footprint. We think that that's going to be beneficial. We know that uh, nickel is going to continue to be supplied out of Indonesia in very large ways, so we're going to need to compete on cost. And we think that we, when we deliver the feasibility study that we will be able to demonstrate that we can compete on cost. But overlaid on that, we have this very low carbon footprint associated with our project, which we think is going to be quite attractive to off-takers and strategic partners as we look to fund the project. It is in an infrastructure rich region, so it takes away a lot of the hassle of actually going into a new part of the world. Um, the Carajas has been established for a long period of time and has some very large projects there. And we expect that the cash flow generation from this project, which will be demonstrated in the feasibility, will be strong. So with that, I would say thank you. Um, we're at booth 22, so if you have any other questions, feel free to come and have a chat. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gordon. Much appreciated. All right, our next presenter. Leap up here on stage with me, sir. You've got a very interesting uh, set of skills. He is both an engineer, he is also an environmental scientist. So a perfect marriage for what we're trying to achieve here today. He's won a raft of awards internationally. He's represented his country at many, many international symposiums on the environment as well. Uh, he has received the Natural Resources Forum for his contribution to driving innovation, education and real change in implementing sustainable policies and 
strategies. You've got a very long list of things that I could read out from here, but obviously he's been chosen for a reason, not just because he's bloody good at his job, but also because he has all these really worthy uh, credentials behind him. So I think I'll sit back, introduce you, Mr. Matsu, uh, on behalf of us, we're going to Nickel Industries, and listen to what you have to say about how Nickel can become relevant and can make us money in our portfolios. Please make him welcome. Yeah, thank you, Chrissy, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for us to be here. And I'm Mutazar. I'm representing Nickel Industries Limited. We are one of the 10 largest nickel producers globally. And today, um, yeah, actually, our managing director, he was here last year. And we thought that this year we want to emphasize more on our sustainability approach in our operations. So that's why I'm here as the uh, head of sustainability. And if you have any questions later, you can send me an email. It's also available, I think, in the conference webpage. And Nickel Industries Limited is an Australian public company. We are uh, one of the ASX 200, and we were listed since 2018. So I think uh, I couldn't agree more with the previous speakers that emphasize um, the energy transitions is only possible to be made if the raw materials, the ingredients, the transition metals are coming from the responsible and sustainable sources. And that's where we stand. So we, we started with the um, class two nickel production, the nickel big iron. But now we are also embarking a new journey, I think, to develop what we call as the third generation HPAL, the Excelsior nickel cobalt that will uh, emit much lower carbon emissions, I think, than the uh, conventional RKF production. And we operate in the two largest nickel pro processing hubs in the world. So we, uh, we, we have four smelters at the moment. Three of them are operating in IMIP, located in the Sulawesi Island, or we can, we can call it the BK Island. And then we have one smelter, one uh, one smelter comprising of four production lines at the Indonesia Weda Bay Industrial Park or IWIP. And with the production capacity of more than 100,000 tons of nickel metal per annum. Then um, in 2023, we also invested in the Huayu Nickel Cobalt Project with the ownership of 10%. And then now we are working with the Shanghai Edison and also with the United Tractors, one of the largest uh, Indonesian company to develop the, the new edge pile that I will, touch, uh, I will touch on later. So uh, I think it was, um, yeah, we, we, we shared a few that Indonesia to the uh, global nickel producer is very important. So uh, we, we see Indonesia as uh, as important as Western Australia in terms of iron ore as, and as important as Middle East in terms of oil and gas. So uh, in terms of nickel, I think uh, Indonesia produce more than half of the global world uh, production. And here on the screen, you can see that the global EV manufacturers are investing in the country as well. So not just uh, for the nickel refinery, but also for, for the upstream process. And if we see on the timeline, I think I don't want to go into the details here, but you can see that uh, there are many Western, many global companies have supported the development of um, nickel downstreaming in Indonesia. I think here just just to mention some, um, but feel like uh, Aramid up until Ford. So I think it shows that the the global companies are are putting their money, putting their investment to Indonesia, and this is uh, something that. It's important, I think, for our company trajectory as well. So be, be sure that Indonesian uh, government support these um, investment projects. And yeah, I think they will provide necessary support to ensure that the, the downstreaming process will go over the line. And uh, for, for us, Nickel Industries Limited, so uh, yeah, we, we do try to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, I will explain more later, but we also uh, consider the social and the governance aspects are as, as important to the environmental aspects. And that's why we, we focus on the 
three pillars, the environmental stewardship, the social responsibility, and then also the uh, economic development. So um, in terms of carbon footprint um, aspect, I think we, we also work to develop the largest solar power plant in Indonesia with the capacity of more than 200 megawatts peak. And I will uh, explain in the next slide. And furthermore, in, in, in the 2023 United Nations Climate Change Conference, or simply called COP28, we announced our net zero commitment by 2050. So it's the same as the Australian government. And we also aim to reduce half of our carbon intensity by 2035. So yeah, considering that um, our company operates in Indonesia, I think it's quite significant because Indonesian government commit to achieve net zero by 2060. So it means that we have to be pioneer in our field and we have to achieve it 10 year faster than, yeah, than our uh, peers in the Indonesia, the country where we operate. And yeah, I think besides the uh, water, we, sorry, besides the energy, the climate change. So we have uh, started to implement renewable energy solutions in our operations. Um, we have the solar plant that power our Hengchaya mine with the capacity of 200 megawatts uh, kilowatt peak. And it reduces our uh, diesel consumptions. Uh, approximately in its 25 life cycle, it will uh, save up to 31 million liters of uh, gasoline. So it's very significant, I think, in terms of the environment and also the cost. And then for the water, I think we are delighted to be, uh, to be named as one of the few nickel companies in Indonesia that can uh, meet the environmental standards set by the government. And for the uh, biodiversity, so since 2019, we have rehabilitated almost 2,000 hectares in Sulawesi with more than 2 million trees planted. So yeah, it, it will help I think, to restore the biodiversity as well as to reduce our uh, overall group emission. And yeah, once, once the Excelsior Nickel Cobalt project is uh, completed, then um, yeah, it will take nickel industries, I think, closer to the top five nickel producers globally, uh, closer to Fale. And I think, yeah, again, since we are relatively a young company, so the company itself was listed in 2018 in the ASX, but yeah, we were established in 2007. But yeah, overall, I think we are still relatively young and we are delighted, I think, to, to be one of the 10 largest nickel producers globally. We saw our uh, remarkable growth, I think, over the past 15 or 16 years. And then our, our third generation HPAL, which is expected to be commissioned by the October 2025, um, will have the carbon footprint lower than uh, 10 tons of carbon dioxide per tons of nickel metal equivalent. And this is quite significant because as you see that the uh, traditional RKF operations, I think it can emit more than uh, 50 tons of carbon dioxide per ton of nickel. And then now we, we want to reduce more than 80% by, by introducing this uh, third generation HPAL. So it will help us as well to achieve our carbon emission target in 2035 and 2050. And yeah, in our operations, we we try to be efficient with our energy usage because when we save the energy, we save the planet and also we save the um, cost as well. So we don't want to lose it as well. Uh, so here we, we recover the heat generated in our uh, kiln. And then we, together with Shanghai Dizen, with Sing San, we have launched the future energy projects back in 2021. And we also introduced the bio-based uh, fuels in our operations that will have lower um, carbon footprint. And in October 2023, we work with the Indonesian company called Cessna to, to develop the largest solar power plant in Indonesia in which nickel industries will be the sole of taker of this project. So we, we don't require any further investment, but um, yeah, after, after the solar power is commissioned, it is expected that uh, we can reduce our emission footprint, I think uh, around to 20% for our Heng Jaya nickel industry. And then um, it will also help again to achieve our carbon commitment in 2035 and 2050. 
And yeah, I think um, we, as I emphasized in the beginning, we are also concerned about the social contribution to the society. So I think the previous speakers have done uh, have done great jobs. I think uh, to to introduce this in in their presentations, and we we also do the same. So we we focus on various aspects in the community development, in education, in health. And we are in the process of uh, developing a corporate foundation as a commitment uh, from Nikal Industries to the community. And earlier this year, we we announced the university scholarship program. So yeah, if you see that now the labor, the manpower for, for our operations, I think in Sulawesi are mostly come from, from Java. Java is the uh, let's say the, the most dominant island in Indonesia uh, with better infrastructure with better education. So we want in the future that many of our workforce to come from the surrounding, from the Sulawesi Island. And that's why we, we work with the top university in Sulawesi to provide a scholarship for the students around our um, operational areas to, to study in mining engineering, environmental engineering, and uh, metallurgical engineering up to four years. So hopefully they will become um, our our role models in the communities and also becomes uh, our future talents for the company. And in terms of uh, governance, I think we, yeah, we comply with the requirements from the Australian government, from the Indonesian government. So we, we are committed to, to prevent the corruptions and bribery in our operations. And also we, uh, we report our anti-modern slavery statement in annual basis in accordance with the regulations in Australia. And we provide equal opportunity to our employees so we don't differentiate them based on the genders, but yeah, we, we remunerate them based on their achievements, based, based on their uh, performance. And in 2022, so I think this will have to be updated later, but in 2022, we, we employ more than 4,000 people across our operations. So this is quite significant. And if I may recall a little bit, so during the COVID period, actually many of the provinces in Indonesia experienced negative growth, but, but for Central Sulawesi and also not Maluku where we operate, uh, the growth remained positive. And yeah, it was supported by the nickel industry in the area. And here, I think um, yeah, in the past uh, two minutes, I want to emphasize more on the proper. So I, I believe many of you maybe are unfamiliar with, but proper is the official environmental rating from the Indonesian government. And yeah, in the past two years, we, yeah, we were delighted because um, Heng Jaya Mine, our um, nickel mining site, has received green ratings for two consecutive years in 2022. Uh, there were just two companies uh, that achieved this. It was just us and Vale, and, and as we all know that uh, Vale Indonesia has operated for more than 50 years, so we, we are proud to be on the same level with them. And moreover, in 2023, um, our ESG score, according to the Indonesian government, was the highest one uh, amongst the nickel sectors, and the third for the overall um, mineral sector, including tin and also uh, iron ore and et cetera. And this is um, yeah, just some of the achievements that we have achieved in the past two years. So um, last year we, we were nominated as the company with the most promising transitions at the uh, GRIT Award and ESG Award Summit in Bangkok. And we, we were also named as the most sustainable nickel company by Trenasia. It's a local media in Indonesia, but yeah, we were compared with other producers, so we were delighted with that. And for the ratings, uh, you can see on the slide, but yeah, we, we received the yeah, good rating from the MSCI and SP. And last but not least, here you, you can check more information about uh, our sustainability performance in the sustainability report in our website. So I think that's all. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, and for those of you who note too, they don't say thank you as soon as they're finished speaking. It's because we're editing all of this and packaging up for the various uh, authoritative bodies, so you don't need my, my voice on there. We do need this voice, Australian Vanadian Limited. Now, they are on, they're focused on developing their project over in Western Australia. They're also working on downstream opportunities 
in the battery market. AVO CEO Graham Arvidsson has joined us up on stage today. Welcome, Graham. You've got 18 years' experience in the mineral sector. I feel like I'm introducing a game show person there. But you've got vast experience in this sector, and today he'll be talking to us about AVO's latest advancements and also their strategic development. Would you please make Graham very welcome? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for the Future Facing Commodities Conference for having me and to the organizers. Indeed, vanadium is a future facing commodity, and I'm very proud to be largely representing vanadium at this conference. And hopefully, today you could think about three quest questions as I'm presenting. Why is vanadium really interesting? Why is it interesting right now? And why might Australian vanadium be a really interesting way to get some exposure to that thematic if unfolding in front of us? Please, in your own time, review this and understand it. Australian vanadium, for those who aren't familiar with you, our core thesis is to be very competitive in producing high purity vanadium oxides. We have a tier one asset in Western Australia and today is the first time we've presented to a public conference like this after we have done uh, what is a very important step for our business, which is to merge with Technology Metals Australia, our neighboring business, and uh, create a one plus one equals three outcome where we are advancing one of the most advanced vanadium projects on the planet and indeed uh, underpinning our thesis to become the world's next primary vanadium producer. Why it's a tier one asset is because even before the merger, we were underpinned by a 25 year mine life and a C1 OPEX of $4.40 per pound, which puts us uh, and any vanadium producer below $5 a pound in world class territory where we could survive any commodity price cycle being a lowest quartile producer and then benefit in the upside as these thematics as a battery metal unfold. Indeed, being in Western Australia is vitally important because currently 85% of the world's vanadium supply comes from Russia, China, and South Africa. So there's a strong need for jurisdictional diversification of supply. Vanadium is a critical metal used in uh, aerospace and defense applications, and equally for the energy sector, it's vitally important that uh, vanadium plays a role in decarbonization moving forward. So the recent merger unlocks the corporate synergies which underpin uh, us becoming a much more bankable asset, but also it unlocks physical synergies that I'll talk to you about today. And then there's the market. So there's this incredible moment happening right now that we are really excited about, where long duration energy storage, in the speak of the energy sector that are batteries that can move electrons for four to 12 hours, that uh, piece of the sector is new. And there's this unique 20 year old technology that has been commercialized at gigawatt hour scale called vanadium flow batteries that are uniquely economic and uniquely technically a good fit for long duration energy storage. There is also a significant dearth of other technologies that can meet the need. And for perspective, there's a 48% CAGR forecasted for that energy sector between now and 2044. It's a staggering terawatt hour story. And even if vanadium plays a small part in that, it's gonna be incredible. And I think what's giving us a lot of confidence right now that this is a here and now story is indeed like in lithium, China are first movers. They are installing gigawatt hour batteries. Literally yesterday, they announced another one gigawatt hour battery going in. Last year, they put in five gigawatt hours of vanadium flow batteries into their grid. They're poised with announced projects of 15 gigawatt hours going in this year. And uh, I'll elaborate on this further. It is a China story right now in terms of really driving that demand change, but we're also seeing scale adoption of this uh, outside of China. And we're really excited about the opportunities for us to participate in the energy markets in Europe, the US and Australia. Australian vanadium, of course, our core moat for being competitive is to be a low cost producer of high purity vanadium oxides that are really suitable to battery and critical metals applications. We're laser focused on getting that done, but equally we want to highlight this business has this wonderful optionality built into it. In 2023, we constructed a commercial scale electrolyte facility. And just last week, we we're very proud to announce that we have already commissioned successfully and produced battery ready electrolyte. And we have another business that we've owned for over five years that has been doing all the hard work to build this incredible network of customers, 
battery manufacturers and a project pipeline in vanadium flow battery use at exactly a time where this long duration energy story is playing out. So the optionality for us to then leverage our ability to already be an electrolyte manufacturer and all of that IP built into vSUN Energy allows us to continue to build other value streams in the business that we look forward to working on. And this really is that time. So why is this happening? Variable energy uh, is variable renewable energy factors are increasing dramatically in many jurisdictions, places like China, where renewable energy needs to be moving electrons from day to night. And indeed, China is, uh, by 2025, would just on announced projects alone would indicate you'd need about 11 of our projects in 2025 to meet that demand. Now, there will be other supply side responses, but as a low cost producer, we're very uh, well poised to participate in that sector. And whether that's uh, assisting China with supply or other jurisdictions who are also adopting the technology, we're really excited and fundamentally, we think this is that inflection point. Three years ago, 1% of vanadium went into batteries. Currently, 10% goes into batteries, which in and of itself we think is a structural change. But there's a point where it truly historically was a steel alloying agent, and then the dominant demand side factor, we think in the very near term, becomes batteries. The other thing happening in China, and as a lithium person uh, spending the last five years there, I just see wonderful parallels here where China is deploying a similar playbook and they are developing not just the batteries and building them out at scale and successfully commissioning them, they're also building factories. So here you see, just in the last 12 months, factories for flow batteries that have been announced that would be the equivalent of 25 gigawatt hours per year. That's about 25 uh, of our operations to meet that demand. But, and we're not naive if some of this doesn't come to pass immediately, but some of it will, and just a small fraction of this really represents uh, something that I think creates a compelling case that vanadium will flip from being a steel metal to a battery metal. Very quickly on our project, it is important that we're in Western Australia from a jurisdictional standpoint and from an ESG standard standpoint, and all the benefits that flow from being in the wonderful ecosystem that we're so grateful to operate in Western Australia. But importantly, West Australia in the Midwest here has a jurisdiction scale vanadium opportunity. And I would personally be so uh, enthused if we could create a lithium story like we did in lithium, where Western Australia has now become the largest lithium producer in the world. There are a load of VTM cell deposits in this area. Uh, of course, I'm going to tell you ours is the best, and indeed there are lots of other people who would conclude that. Uh, and we are indeed the most advanced vanadium project in this area. Uh, but we want to see our project as not just stage one, which is the very large scale, low cost producer story, but if the demand follows, we want to be poised to participate in the growth of the sector. Um, just very briefly on the merger, it is a really important story emerging for us where we achieve the corporate synergies through the merger in February, but we're really just now coming to understand the physical synergies that when we can actually remove the invisible boundaries uh, called tenements, right, and then have an, uh, an optimized way of mining the ore body, there's actually ways that we can con continue to further improve on this tier one asset in terms of operating cost and capital cost. And we're working very uh, diligently now to do that. So in April, we expect to announce the combined mineral resource estimate, which is taking two 25-year mine lives, unifying them, removing those invisible boundaries, and creating a one plus one equals three outcome. And then also launching what we are calling the optimized feasibility study, where two companies have world-class DFSs. We're taking what the optionality created out of the merger can do and building that into what we think is an even better asset in an OFS that will then underpin the financing of the project. On the corporate synergy side of the merger, this is really important. What we have done is de-risk the path to financing. And importantly, on the debt side, this is something we're working very hard on. That pre prior to the merger, it was a difficult ask for favorable government funding to get behind us. Now, with one company owning the entire ore body and in the advanced state we're in, and in very advanced discussions with those favorable parties, we do expect to be able to be successful now in garnering the support of those favorable debt funding opportunities. And we're also working very hard on the rest of the debt package. Importantly, last year, we secured a $49 million federal grant. This uh, was 
paid out in a first tranche of $10 million before, but some catalysts to watch out for is we're working very hard to unlock the additional milestone payments in that grant, and I think it's a wonderful way for us in a non-dilutive way to continue to get working capital to develop the asset. Importantly, through the merger, we retained a very uh, supportive investor being resource capital funds. They're a very sophisticated investor and a great partner, and they really do believe the vanadium thebanic and particularly the role that flow batteries will play as a fully commercialized, ready-to-go technology that's highly economic for long-duration energy storage. We continue to work hard on additional strategic, strategic partners, and a big uh, important piece of the puzzle is offtake and making sure those are the right partners and ideally linked to the energy sector and ideally with equity for alignment is things that we're running to ground and throughout the year we look forward to updating the market on that. So catalyst wise, look out for the MRE in April, look out for a project update in June. Uh, we also are diligently working on a scenario where two businesses were very well advanced on our permitting, so making sure that we unify those permitting processes in the most expedited way and making sure it gives us the optionality and the asset that we need is important, and we'll keep updating the market. But this business is one of the most advanced in terms of permitting to a very high ESG standard level that you'll find in the vanadium sector. We talked about offtake, but there's also some co-product opportunities here that we'll be just putting our foot down on offtake, securing binding offtake to just make sure that aspect of the project is de-risked in the near term. And so all of these strategic imperatives are better enabled by the merger and really just completing it in February, we're just getting started at really putting the foot down on the pedal under the lower risk scenario of really proving up that this asset is investment ready and indeed we can move towards production in the near term. In summary, 25 year mine life before, but with the merger, you've taken two 25 year mine lives and also doing a one plus one equals three. It's an incredible scale asset. We already previously in the DFS, DFS had a 440C1 OPEX in the vanadium world, if you're unfamiliar. If you're less than five, you're a world class producer and you can survive the commodity cycles and for us, as people in our team who have operated vanadium assets, it is vitally important to be competitive in producing low-cost, high-purity vanadium oxides. That's our story, and that's our core thesis. We also are already successful in producing electrolyte, participating in the value chain upward, and we're poised right at that time where there's an inflection point happening, and vanadium has gone from 1% three years ago to 10% in batteries, and I hope some of those statistics in China can draw some parallelisms with the lithium story, where indeed the transition's gonna happen very rapidly and move from being a steel alloying agent predominantly to now a market where the supply demand dynamics are driven by batteries. And we're really excited to be ready to go in that space. We're also advancing all those strategic imperatives, so do watch out for opportunities on the debt side in particular that will, I think, signal very strongly to our investors that this is, is an investment grade tier one asset and de-risk the path to FID. And don't forget, there is some very significant optionality built into this business in our capability to produce electrolyte, but also with Vsun Energy, where for over five years, We've been building really strong relationship with utilities and energy sector players and the IP and knowledge of how and where flow batteries have a value in use and deep relationships with credible flow battery manufacturers internationally. So I invite you to come talk to me. I'm around at the conference, learn more about the business. If you can get behind the vanadium thematic, indeed, I think AVL is positioned as the next global leader and we hope to be the very next primary vanadium producer. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, innovation is a big part of the future of the resources industry. One of the TV shows that I host in and produce in Australia is all about innovation, and I love the sound of what this next company is achieving, Geo40. Hello, you snuck up on me. Well done. <laughs> I love what you're doing. You've developed a unique iron exchange technology for lithium recovery. Um, processing a wide range of global brands. It's a sustainable recovery of strategic minerals from fluids. Yes, I did read that so that I got it correct for all of us. But I think it's really interesting. You're operating two plants, one's over in, in New Zealand, um, and you're recovering silica nanoparticles 
from geothermal fluids. And I'm really interested to see exactly how you're doing this. Would you please make welcome everyone, John Worth, to talk about the company's extensive North American piloting program and uh, that's underway now, and how they intend to move that to demonstration scale later on this year. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, we use this line at Geo40, um, we made it up ourselves. It's DLE is our DNA, and I'm going to try and uh, give evidence to that uh, in about 10 minutes. So I'll just jump straight into it. We, we're an unusual business in the DLE space because we have a fairly mature business in silica recovery. Uh, this is our flagship asset in New Zealand. It processes about 8 million litres of fluid uh, every day, and we produce about 3,000 tonnes of high-quality colloidal silica um, that we sell all over the world. Uh, as you would imagine, we took a fairly logical scale-up process out of the lab into pilot plant stage. We've got two of those, one in New Zealand, one in Japan. Uh, five years ago now, we built a demonstration plant that still runs today, makes a bit of money. And then the big picture is our flagship asset. So, um, you know, we're a fairly serious business in silica. And I, and I think the reason I started with this is that this is one of the key things that differentiates us in the lithium space. Um, this is a journey we've, we've done before. Um, this big acid is the only plant on the planet that gets silicon nanoparticles out of fluid. Um, and it positions us very well for lithium. Um, and just, just, I guess, another thing that's, that's interesting, uh, most of our silica sales are accompanied by what's called an EPD, which is an environmental product declaration. This is a piece of third-party work that, that quantifies the carbon footprint of our product. Uh, and we have the lowest carbon chloral silica on the planet by a factor of about five. Uh, and again, we, we, we'll talk about it through the next three days. You know, we don't see a, a premium for green lithium yet, um, but we think it will come. Uh, when we started this business around a decade ago, <coughs> uh, I guess a, a group of miners got together and, and really tried to eliminate exploration risk. And the logic was to target um, geothermal fluids where geothermal power generation takes place. And New Zealand is an extraordinary leader uh, in geothermal power generation. So the government um, drilled a volcanic plateau in the 1950s. And in 1958, the, the world's very first large-scale geothermal power station was commissioned uh, close to a town called Taupo uh, in New Zealand. And New Zealand has remained at the cutting edge of geothermal ever since. Uh, and so a group of miners 10 years ago, uh, after you know, decades in the Congo, so, crikey, there's got to be an easier way to get, get minerals. Uh, and, of course, it's this idea of targeting minerals and fluids. So the original technology hypothesis was to uh, target hot fluids, where you find high levels of silica, and where you also find lithium, boron, and cesium. Uh, and I guess a, a few things became apparent. Firstly, silica is quite a valuable mineral in its own right. Um, but typically in these fluids, the lithium concentrations are quite low, uh, and that's... Um, perhaps formed a key part of our, our logic um, going forward. I guess what, what wasn't apparent to the, to the founders at the time was that this story is actually just as relevant to cold fluids, right, where you maybe don't have so much silica, but you also have lithium and boron. Uh, but because we were initially chasing geothermal fluids, we were very focused on, on low grades. So a good geothermal power station might have lithium at 50 parts per million, maybe 70 parts per million. Uh, and so this really influenced our thinking as we, as we got into DLE. Uh, we started the journey in direct lithium extraction uh, four and a half years ago now. And most of you will have seen this graphic. Um, this, is, this is Alex Grant's um, graphic on the, really, the three broad technology families in DLE. Absorption on the left, that's Liven, Dow, Sunresin, um, and others. Um, iron exchange, um, Lilac, Standard Lithium, originally um, us. And then, and then I guess a lesser number of players in solvent extraction. So because we were very focused on, on low-grade fluids, uh, we went the obvious route and chose iron exchange. But that's where the similarities between us and most of our competitors end. Um, iron exchange is usually a, a kind of a bead, a fairly large bead and a column. That's the top photo. We then pass fluid through that column and try and get it to stick to the surface of the, whatever you're targeting, to stick to the surface of the bead. Um, we don't do that. We, we've followed, the, I guess, the process um, flow sheet of what's called CIL or CIP for gold recovery, carbon and leach or carbon and pulp. And in that method, we're working with a much smaller particle, which obviously has a much higher surface area. 
Um, that's reasonably terrifying uh, to a lot of folks, but because we've spent so long working with nanoparticles, this is something we're, we're very comfortable with. Uh, and what that means is um, you can get ultra-high recoveries, which of course is pretty important if you're going to target low-grade fluids. Uh, as you would imagine, uh, back in uh, 2020, uh, we built our first pilot pl uh, plant. 2022, we built our second pilot plant. Uh, we built those plants actually during COVID, when it was pretty hard to go out and travel the world. So we built plants at home in New Zealand, and we shipped brines into these plants. Um, and so Christmas 22, we got to 100 cycles for the first time. We're now running up sort of beyond 500 cycles. Um, and a number of things come out of that. Um, you know, we've got uh, very low media losses per cycle, down in the fractions of a percent. Uh, our media cost is very low. We're not making a complex bead. We're making a very simple media. Uh, low impurity carryover, and with almost every brine we've processed, we make battery-grade lithium carbonate. Uh, and so like anybody in this space, we started processing different types of brines. As I've mentioned, we started on geothermal brines, both out of Europe and New Zealand. Uh, we moved on to classic salar brines. We were able to process medium and high-grade salar brines very successfully. Uh, and then on to uh, brines out of the US and Canada. And I think if, and you know, Joe will cover this in his uh, panel this afternoon, what we tend to see is, is really absorption technologies seem to work better at, at higher grades, and iron exchange, and particularly a sort of CIL, CIP style of iron exchange, works very, very well at the lower grades. Uh, and so this is, this is the space where we believe we have real strategic advantage, the sort of 50 to 250 ppm um, grade. And that's super interesting, because if you take out two pieces of geography in the US, most of North America uh, is in that grade range. Right? So, um, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, I've read Vault Rush, um, what we're really trying to do here is to unlock the potential of these brines in North America. I'll just explain why we think we can do that. Um, this is a, a, an OPEX versus grade curve. So what we've done here is we've plotted on a handful of the brines that we've processed and modelled OPEX on. What that shows you is a, is a New Zealand brine at 10 ppm. That's not commercially very attractive, as you might imagine. But interestingly, there, you know, American brines at 25 and 50 ppm versus uh, European brines up at sort of 200 ppm, the OPEX isn't that different. Right? And that is, that is a fundamental feature of our tech. We, pro, you know, we have to pump a bit more brine to get the same number of lithium ions, but actually the, the OPEX curve is very, very flat. Uh, and that's why we believe we can work you know, very extensively across North America. Um, I just think uh, it's worth touching on tech just for a second. And I get asked every day, you know, which tech will be the winner? Um, look, I think you have to understand, I guess, every brine is different. If you're working in central Texas versus western Texas, the brines will be different. They'll be different. Uh, 10 kilometres apart, sometimes you know, half a kilometre apart. And then what goes with that is the nature of projects, right? And in every project you look at, the inputs will be different. Uh, you'll have, obviously, the different brines. You, you, you'll have uh, different reagent costs, state by state, province by province. Uh, you'll have different environmental regulation. You'll have different utility costs and so on. Right? And what that means is that um, the techs will all shake out and perform differently in different places. Um, I think perhaps there's a broader thematic here and, and that if you follow sort of Goldman's latest piece on techs, there's perhaps a couple of dozen DLE techs in development. And I think out of that, we expect sort of half dozen or so will emerge at scale uh, in the near term. You know, we certainly plan to be one of them. Um, but I guess the contrast is there are hundreds and hundreds of lithium resources out there. And what that tells you is the lithium world really is sort of Another cliche, but it's tech short and resource long. And so we don't see other DLE players as competitors. You know, we want them to succeed as much as, as we wish to succeed. And where we can help them, we will, um, because the, the sector needs all of us. Um, you know, the top is our journey in, in silica. We're following that exact same playbook in lithium. Right bottom left is our second pilot plant. It's been running very successfully. Uh, what we're heading towards is a demo plant. Uh, we'll be in design of that. Uh, next week, uh, and then what we're trying to get to is our first sort of 5,000 tonne per annum plant as fast as we possibly can. Uh, one of the ways we're going to get there is, is, I guess, an interesting program of work um, over, the, over this year. I just want to draw your attention to that middle circle. So we've done a lot of piloting on brines in New Zealand with brines that we've shipped. 
We're now repeating some of that work uh, in the field. Uh, and so this is, uh, we've built two of these. Um, these things are on the road now in North America. The idea really is it's, it's pretty straightforward. We turn up on a resource owner's site at no cost to that resource owner. We will process their brine, give them back a decent quantity of lithium chloride, um, some lithium carbonate, and a long-form technical report on what our tech can achieve on that resource. Right? And we're doing that to get wide exposure to North American resources, figure out where we can work most successfully, um, but also to open up uh, and, I guess, prove to different players in the sector what we can do. We know we have to, we know we have to prove what we can do. Um, this is the T-shirt. Um, this is roughly where the tour looks like it will go. We've been building in Wyoming and California. We're heading to West Texas uh, in about a week and a half's time. We're hoping then to head east and then up through the middle, and then eventually up into Canada. Um, music lovers might recognize the font uh, and the cheesy bottom line, you know, North America, Lithium Nirvana. So it um, looks like being a lot of fun. Uh, I just want to touch on, you know, North America is a very interesting place in terms of lithium brine resources. And we've heard a lot about the, I guess, the oil field formation waters, or the separation waters, probably more accurately. And we've heard, you know, we've seen Exxon uh, buy an interesting site in Arkansas. Um, I think these resources are very interesting because they, they're the opportunity to scale fast. Now these are brines that have been separated from oil and have been re-injected since the 50s. Right? So if you can target these brines and pull lithium out of them, that is an opportunity to scale fast. And the scaling opportunity is really on the DLE guy. It's really limited by how fast the DLE player can scale up. And we think that makes these you know, particularly interesting in the near term. Um, I guess the the interesting part there is if you're working on oil and gas separation waters, you will have to do pre-treatment of those brines. So you have to get good at being both a DLE guy and a pre-treatment guy. Those things sit hand in hand, and they will drive your OPEX, and you need to be very good in that space. Um, I think the other extreme that we're seeing in North America is, I guess, the cleaner formation waters. This is drilling holes into aquifers. Um, that's a space that's not quite so developed. A lot of people are you know, still land banking, just starting to think about drilling programs. That's going to take some time. I guess the nice thing about those brines is they're typically cleaner, so your pre-treatment costs tend to evaporate, um, and they'll probably lead the cost curve in the medium term. I think the other thing that's interesting is another sort of resource category in the middle that's emerged, uh, things like potash brines. Um, some of these brines that didn't look very interesting a couple of years ago that might have had 80 ppm lithium in them, if you've got the right tech, um, they become pretty compelling. Um, look, our job this year is, is really to try and get this right. Uh, we'll get out on a bunch of sites. Um, you know, our job here is to emerge this year. We've been pretty invisible as a New Zealand company. Um, that's changing very quickly. Um, you know, we want to be the DLE partner of choice uh, in North America. And we've got a fair idea what that looks like. Um, that means we need to uh, have the most robust tech that works across a whole range of different resource types. Um, you know, we want to be the best supported technology. We think a DLE tech partner has to be glued to the project for the life of the project. Right? DLE is complex, the offtake products are complex, and the brine will change. Uh, that means you need a great team, you need to be great people to work with. Um, you also need to make the best quality products you possibly can at the back end, right? lowest impurities. Um, and, and much as we do in New Zealand when we work with Maori um, and exercise kaitiakitanga over our resource, you obviously need the highest standards um, of environmental performance. And we think if we do those things right, that will get us uh, into you know, partnerships with the best brine owners. Right? We think the best brine owners want the very same thing. Um, as you would expect, we do. We're, we're a fairly small company, um, but we do formal ESG sustainability performance reporting, two annual reports, a sustainability performance report and an annual report. Um, you know, when you're working with oil and gas majors in the US, they would expect um, nothing less. And I guess just to wrap up, you know, we'll, we'll hear, we've heard a lot of negative sentiment about price. Um, I think there's, a, there's an interesting piece here. I think the fundamentals of the industry are very strong. Uh, if anyone's driven the car that's parked out in the, um, uh, in the exhibition hall, it doesn't take any convincing. Um, these are great cars. We think lithium's never been more exciting um, than it is today. And, and just to wrap up, um, Tribeca, um, we use them in an advisory capacity. We like them very much. We're very pleased they're sponsoring this conference. Uh, they're also one of our investors. Um, so kudos to them for bringing this group together. Nice. Shameless plug, Jonathan Worth. Well done. All right, 6 billion tonnes.
in resources, magnetite mines, they're developing the Razorback Iron Project, Iron Ore Project in South Australia, and they're doing that to meet the accelerating demand for premium DR grade products created by the iron and steel sectors decarbonisation. Now, the company CEO is this fellow here, Tim Dobson. He's got more than 30 years of international experience leading and developing world-class operations. He's here today to discuss recent advancements at Razorback and South Australia's green iron opportunity. Please make him welcome. Thank you, Christy. Great to be back in Singapore, and uh, sadly, it's 35 years of experience now. Time's moving on. Um, when you think about future-facing commodities, you might not think about iron ore, first come, thing that comes to mind, but as you'll hear from me in the next 15 minutes, magnetite, as one of the key iron ore minerals, is very much a critical mineral for our future, and in fact, one of the most important future-facing commodities. I'll be talking about our project, which is based in South Australia. We're a small company with a monster project. As you heard from Christy, six billion tonnes we have in mineral resources. And we are in the middle of a, of a massive and profound transition from steelmaking as they decarbonise and move away from carbon and coal using technologies to technologies that need to use hydrogen and therefore a very high grade iron and oil. I'll explain that uh, as we go through this uh, process. But on the right hand side of this slide, from an investor's perspective, you'll see that the time is now, if you're thinking about investing in this uh, huge uh, space of future facing commodity of magnetite, now's the right time. We're actually a very unnoticed company at the moment, very small market cap, but we've spent the last two years rebuilding the team, including the board and management, uh, to time the project delivery of our project uh, in line with what's happening in the global steel market. For example, Simon Wonke, the second director on the left-hand side here, he was the CEO of ArcelorMittal's global mining business, for example, up until he retired a few years ago, and he's chosen Magnetite Mines to join the board. Myself, I come from an operations background, 35 years in large international global mining projects, a lot of time in high-pressure acid leach, nickel and cobalt. I was the president of the Ambadavi joint venture in Madagascar for three years. That's an $8 billion nickel and cobalt project, very complex. I'm glad to say that magnetite processing is nowhere near as difficult as high pressure acid leach. So what's happening in steel making? Steel is a massive industry. It's grown incredibly strongly, as you'll be well aware, uh, over the last 50 years. It's in every part of our built out environment and it's continuing to escalate. It's just under 2 billion tonnes a year now of new steel is made and that consumes over 2 billion tonnes of iron ore every year. But it's a very dirty industry from a climate change perspective. 8% of global carbon emissions actually come from steel making. So this actually is having a profound effect on, on, the, on the climate itself is the actual art of making steel. You can see from the chart on the bottom left how much of the change has to happen in the carbon footprint of steel makers between now and when the mandates for most of the steel making governments have made to decarbonise their industry. It's, it's absolutely uh, a massive job. Wood Mackenzie have uh, forecast that it's going to take $1.3 trillion to transform the global steel industry with that spend taking place, it's already started, uh, and through to 2050. The, global, the largest global steel makers on the right hand side here have all made uh, mandates com and commitments to, to decarbonise, partially by 2030 and fully by 2050 in most cases, with China and India, the biggest steel makers, uh, needing a little bit more time to do that. So what's going to happen? What's changing here? Across the top of this fairly busy chart, you'll see the dark line shows how 70% of today's steel is made. We take medium grade iron ore, we take coking coal, we ship it to countries that have large vertically integrated steel making facilities, mostly in China, more than 50% of global steel is made in China, but J Japan and Korea, India and Taiwan are very large steel makers as well in our region. And we turn that into steel in big uh, integrated facilities, producing a very high carbon footprint. Some countries have, who with lots of natural gas have developed an alternative technology using natural gas and direct reduced iron technology. And after 20 years of this, the blast furnace operators trying to find a way to, to decarbonise their blast furnaces and not being successful, they are now forced uh, begrudgingly to turn to this alternative technology of direct reduced iron. So direct reduced iron takes place in the solid phase and it uses natural gas at the moment. It will use hydrogen in the future and that product then becomes the feedstock along with scrap metal into electric arc furnaces. And when they run on renewable energy, as you'll see across the bottom of the chart, you can actually achieve a green steel product. So there's a green iron and a green steel product. 
This will split the steel industry in two. It's already starting to happen. Green iron will be made in countries where there is high grade iron ore and hydrogen, and it will be shipped to other countries where, there are, where they have a market for the steel and will have electric arc furnaces. So instead of shipping coal and iron ore in the future, we'll see direct reduced iron in the form of hot briquetted iron, HBI, being shipped around the world. These decisions are being made as we speak. The Middle East is set now to emerge as a major player as at the starting point of this transition. Wood Mackenzie here have shown how many EAFs are going to have to be built uh, to make the difference in the, in the carbon footprint over the next 50 years. It's quite profound. Two years ago, China approved 42 new electric arc furnaces. That was more than the previous six years running. China on the front foot. They've actually got 10 direct reduced iron, green iron plants already in development. They're very much, as usual, on the front foot. This is already happening. In Australia, where our project is located, Peter Malinowskis, the Premier of South Australia, three or four weeks ago uh, asked for expressions of interest for what will be Australia's first DRI or green iron plant to be made in Australia. We will obviously be making a submission into that process. And just last night, the US committed $6 billion to decarbonisation for industry, including six green iron projects in the US. So this, as I say, this is actually happening as we speak. Now, what's the kicker? The kicker is that you cannot use medium grade ores with high amounts of impurities to feed this new technology. You need a very, very high uh, purity grade of iron ore. That can be made from magnetite concentrates at the mine site. And it's not all magnetites are created equal. Some have more impurities than other when they're concentrated. This bubble chart on the left shows all of the major hematite mines there in Australia and Brazil, the blue bubbles of Brazil, some of the Australian magnetite projects that are already running. And you'll see on the x-axis the amount of impurities that are in these products. They're not enough for direct reduced iron. The small little box in the top left-hand corner is how pure we have to get the product to meet the current grade for DRI. Our Razorback project, as I'll talk about in a moment, actually has the ability to meet that specification. And we expect the yawning gap in the supply and, develop, and, the supply and demand curve on the right-hand side, this is Wood McKenzie's data, and see how uh, you have almost identical chart showing that this, uh, this, this gap expands massively as blast furnaces come offline and EAFs, which are currently on order, are built and are looking for feed. So this is, uh, this is what's happening. So where are we? We're in South Australia. So the, camp, the regions of the world that have lots of renewable energy, a mandate to make hydrogen, the ability to do it, and high-grade iron ores will be the winners out of this uh, transition. And South Australia certainly ticks all the boxes. South Australia has had a profound uh, escalation in the amount of renewable energy on their grid. They've gone from 1% in the mid-2000s to 73% last year, renewable energy on the entire electric, electricity network in South Australia. That'll be at 100% renewables in the next two to three years, well before the government's target of 2030. South Australia also has a lot of magnetite. We've got six billion tonnes just in our projects, as you'll see. And, and of course, the government now has realised this opportunity, and as I mentioned, it's calling for a hydrogen industry to form. It's supporting that, and now a, a green iron industry to form on the back of it. This is what our project looks like. It's massive. It's outcropping iron ore. These ridges are pure. Uh, iron ore. They've got uh, magnetite ridges uh, all the way through. This is 12 or 14 kilometres of 110 kilometres of strike length we have in our tenements. This is our Razorback project. There's four and a half billion tonnes in this project alone. And last year we converted uh, two billion tonnes of this resource into ore reserves ready for development. We're halfway through a DFS to bring this uh, big project to life. Where is it located? 240 kilometres to the north northeast of Adelaide and 160 kilometres uh, east of Port Pirie. Um, you'll see there's a railway line running 50 kilometres to the north, which is, from an iron ore pers uh, perspective, is a godsend to have rail uh, logistics infrastructure so close to the project. So that's a big tick for this project as well. We have two ports to choose from. We've put green dots on two ports here. We see those, along with the government of South Australia, as the logical places for these green iron hubs to form, where hydrogen will come together with high-grade iron ore and produce green iron into the future for export to our regional steel makers in particular. Our domestic steel industry is not that big, but our regional steel industry is huge. The project uses conventional standard technology. As I said, high pressure acid leach, where I've spent half my career, is extremely complex. Uh, concentrating magnetite is extremely easy. You grind it down to a very fine point, you put it across a magnet, you, you separate the magnetic particles from the non-magnetic particles and you end up with a very nice concentrate. It'll look like any other mine uh, as you fly across Australia, for those that fly across Australia, open pits, 
waste dumps, tailings dam, plant, very straightforward technologies. We've, we've chosen a 5 million tonne per annum output as our logical starting point. Stage one for our project will be 5 million tonnes. That's a not too big to fail because it's a too big a mega project and will blow out in, ca in cost and time, and not too small to fail because of poor margins. 5 million tonne is the sweet spot, but with, with such a big resource, if we stayed at 5 million tonnes, we'd be still running after 90 years on the current resources at Razorback. So logically, we would expand to 10 million tonnes after a few years, and we've established our brand and settled the plant down into, into production. Capital cost for such a big plant, the bottom line on the table on the right shows you just between 1 to 1.3 billion uh, US dollars is required to get stage one up and running, and that will double to get stage two up and running to over two, to around 2.5 billion US dollars. So it's a big, expensive project. And uh, as you'll see in a moment, we certainly don't anticipate funding this on our own as a junior ASX listed uh, company. We had Wood Mackenzie do a piece of work to us to place us on the global cost curve of iron ore production on a value in use basis. So this is where we take all iron ore specifications. Low grade ores have discounts, high grade ores have premiums over and above or below 62%, which is the current benchmark you see on the, on the news each night. And we bring all that onto one cost curve by subtracting or adding those discounts and premiums. And that way we can compare all world production. This puts uh, our project and our specification on into the second quartile for our stage one uh, production and into the first quartile for stage uh, two production at 10 million tonnes per annum. So that may give us a lot of comfort of the economics of our project based on the, uh, on the premiums that we'll, we'll achieve for this product. As I mentioned, we don't want to, uh, we don't intend to finance this project on our own. This is logically a joint venture with motivated off-takers. Very, very well proven model in Australia for large iron ore projects and coal projects for that matter. Um, and we, I've spent the last 18 months after joining the company uh, talking to a whole range of potential partners for this project and there's been a long line. We are actually having the, I guess, the luxury of being able to pick and choose who we want to talk to the most and we're currently in uh, transactional discussions now with uh, several parties in the region, uh, which I can't talk about yet because we haven't made announcements about helping us fund to the rest through the rest of our DFS and get us to an FID and then become uh, and, and then earn the ability to become a joint venture partner for our project. Uh, and this this momentum in um, in interest in our project has escalated massively just in the last 18 months. From an ESG perspective, uh, I come from a bigger company background, as you've heard, and, and myself and the board understand that we need to create the platform of the company that we want to be. We've actually branded our ESG platform. We've called it Foresight, um, and we are set out to role model stakeholder engagement um, and, and, and aligned ourselves with our customers downstream steel industry uh, um, transparent sustainability reporting functions. So that's our ESG platform. Where are we at with the project? Well, we spent the last uh, year and a or two uh, knocking over a whole range of milestones on the left-hand side. We're now locking down the last pieces of infrastructure. We're partnering at the moment, as you've heard, and um, we're about to put our mining lease application into the South Australian government, which will kick off the formals approvals process. So in summary, what's happening here? We've got a massive decarbonisation tailwind. $1.3 trillion of the steel industry has to spend to decarbonise itself. They have they are already ordering EAFs and they're looking for high grade feeds to feed those EAFs into the future. This will take place over the coming five to 15 years. Our project's in a A grade location in South Australia. We have 6 billion tonnes in resources and now 2 billion tonnes in ore reserves. We're halfway through a DFS, we're progressing this to a 5 million tonne per annum project. We've got great support from the South Australian government. And I was actually in Canberra last week. I had 20 meetings with senators and members of parliament. Um, and I think we can expect to see some bigger announcements coming out of uh, the Federal Government of Australia on the, iron, on the green iron front in the, coming, uh, in the coming weeks and months. So from an investor's perspective, those sitting in front of me in this audience, this is a golden opportunity and it won't last long. We are a very small cap, uh, less than $30 million company with a project that has a current NPV of two to $3 billion and that, uh, that won't last long. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much. They were very good at timing. Well done. I've got some questions to ask about Phil Crabb and some others afterwards. Watch those steps as yep. you go. Thank you very much. Up. Come and see us in the, in the booth. Thanks so much. That was really interesting. Right. First of our three panel sessions for today, and the topic is 
decarbonisation, a generational investment opportunity. We've got three panel sessions. We're also doing lithium. And uh, what else are we doing? Lithium today. We've got a couple, haven't we, coming up? Lithium and also uranium. I've got to forget that one. That's in everyone's uh, tongue at the moment. So our moder moderator for this panel is John Stover. John is the portfolio manager and managing partner from Tribeca. And John, what I'll do, you're all marked up, aren't you? I will get you, Jonathan, to introduce all of your esteemed panel members to everyone, if that's OK. Thanks very much, Chrissy, And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, as Chrissy mentioned, I'm the portfolio manager for the Tribeca Asia Credit Strategy. Decarbonization is obviously one of the biggest themes this week. Uh, you know, it is going to be one of the largest collective human undertakings of all time. And you know, we really see this as both an opportunity and a challenge. So obviously, there's going to be a tremendous amount of investment opportunities on the back of this. But it's also a challenge for the corporates in terms of you know, how they manage their own emissions and how they're communicating that with their stakeholders. So we wanted to have this panel to you know, dig into the, both the investment opportunity set as well as uh, discuss how mining companies specifically are handling this issue. So we do have a few experts in, in, in this field. Um, I'm going to just introduce them and then we'll, we'll get straight into it. Andrew Wong, who's sitting to my left, is a director at TriRec, which is a global early stage decarbonization VC based in Singapore. Before joining TriRec, Andrew was a writing analyst at CLA's Taiwan Equity Research Department, covering suppliers in the EV and solar supply chains. He started his career in his hometown of Montreal at Deloitte. Thanks for being here, Andrew. Swetri Chung is a director and founding member of Decarbonization Partners, which is BlackRock's joint venture with Tomasek that invests in the next generation of innovative decarbonization solutions and businesses to achieve a net zero carbon economy. She has 20 years of experience in organizing, executing, and managing investments globally across the energy, environment, industrials, and transportation logistics sectors. Thanks, Vichy. Jamie Strauss, uh, at the end there, is the founder of Digby, which is the only ESG disclosure ratings and communications platform designed specifically for the mining sector. Jamie spent previously over three decades in the mining industry. So uh, with this topic, we'll, we'll sort of get right into it. Uh, you know, I want to start with Andrew and Swetchy. There's obviously been a lot of shifts recently, you know, over the past few years in the, in the VC and growth equity landscape. Uh, specifically to decarbonization, you know, what are you guys seeing in terms of deal flow, investor appetite, and in terms in this space? Um, uh, yeah. let's, let's start with Andrew. Okay, yeah. sure, sure. Uh, well, no, no, I, I think definitely, you know, decarbonization climate tech has been, you know, the bright spot in terms of VC trends over the past uh, year or so. Um, you know, there's been a lot more deal flow, I'd say, in terms of uh, opportunities. Uh, and also, I guess, a more diversity in terms of the types of deals that we're seeing as well, right? So I think for us, you know, we've seen um, quite a few, uh, more so in the harder to abate sectors, you know, whether they're dealing in the, the industrial side of things, uh, whether it's in energy as well, right? So I mean, we've looked at things such as nuclear fusion, uh, green steel, uh, carbon capture as well. So I think, you know, it speaks to the amount of ambition that a lot of these founders have, and, and I think the willingness of investors to look at the space and put money into the space as well. Um, and I think, you know, as we go further into it, I think, you know, there's also a trend about more people are, are looking to fill out that capital stack as well, right? I mean, I, I think with VC, a lot of people are focused more on the early side of things, um, but I think now we're seeing people more willing to go into that mid-stage uh, side of things because I think, you know, somewhat, a few things have been de-risked, right? I think maybe from that uh, debt financing portion of things, if you're building a plant or facility for a first of a kind type of uh, deployment, then I think that's super important. Um, and then, you know, as you move further down uh, that, that capital stack, right, I think more and more people will come on board as well. So um, yeah, more deals, diversity of deals, and I guess more players coming in that space in terms of types of investors. Sure, thanks. Yeah, for me, I speak from a perspective of a growth equity investor in the decarbonization space. I will take a step back and kind of look a little bit back at history and versus now. Um, what we're seeing now is that there's a general sense of rush of capital to the decarbonization thematic. But in reality, there's really quite different pools of capital at play and they don't necessarily commensurate as what I see now. Um, just for context, during Clean Tech 1.0, we have about 140 kind of uh, VC funds, generalists investing in the climate tech space. Um, today, we have about 170 over uh, VC funds, especially specialists in uh, climate tech investment. And this is just amongst the 2,500 over VC funds uh, that have invested in this space in the last two years. So what it tells us is that there's just 
a lot more allocation of capital by early stage funds in the space, but there's still insufficient uh, funds looking to fund companies for their growth stage. Um, when we look at absolute dollars, we're talking about two billions of capital in during clean tech 1.0 2013 and now we are about 30 billion of capital chasing this space so there is money there but the money is not evenly spread out let's put it that way um, and for a company when they need to go from a development stage uh, after developing the technology to a deployment stage you need 10 times of capital to help the company get there and today, the amount of capital that's available for the growth stage, we're talking about just $1 of capital available for every $3 of demand there. Um, so all in, I think we, we just need a lot more focus on the growth stage. Um, all these companies that we are backing in the climate tech space, they tend to be some form of a capex spend, right? Because we are building new machines, uh, is essentially. So that's, that's, that's uh, where I see kind of like different stage of uh, funding available for, for the space. And maybe just one more point to add in terms of like the deal environment that we're seeing in the climate tech space here. Um, I think not unlike the typical private equity environment, uh, investors are getting more cautious for sure. Um, people are focusing on sound business model, good technology, but increasingly we're seeing um, trend trends like you know, slower exits uh, in terms of IPO, M&A, meaning that companies will have to stay private for longer. So more opportunity in terms of uh, private equity investments. Um, other things that we are also seeing is um, more insiders actually coming in to help bridge the company to their next milestone before they go to the external market. So quite important to have deep pocket uh, shareholders there for, for the startups. And I think last thing is like the terms and valuation we see also some moderation there in terms of expectation by the founders. But all in, there's still a lot of dry powder that we're talking about in the space. It's all about uh, finding the right fit in terms of the technology, the company, the valuation, the terms. Great, thanks. And, and turning to you, Jamie, I mean, you're focused on ESG more broadly, but within the E component of that, you know, what trends are you seeing from the corporates in terms of decarbonization action and, and reporting? And you know, how is that impacting investor appetite? Yeah, thanks, John. I think uh, I think I think as actually just coming back, I think we need to take a step back. I mean, if we break down the carbon output, I think steel and cement is five and a half billion carbon uh, um, uh, CO2, and I think mining, direct mining, is just about half a billion. So it just kind of puts it into context as to what the issues are. But if you look at the big the big trends, look, government governments are still pushing for the decarbonisation. So that's the first thing. The second thing is governments and others are pushing for responsibility. And I think if you look at one of the big trends we've seen, we just saw the previous presentation from uh, Magnetite and Tim Dobson. I mean, that's huge, and it's happening in front of our eyes today. Um, this has a huge impact in terms of not only the capex with regards to the steel industry or the, and the mining industry to uh, reposition the sector for certain uh, DII, uh, DI uh, uh, product, uh, but also the huge capex that's going to go into uh, changing the blast furnaces. So I think that's a huge element that kind of uh, um, you know affects one of the largest part of the mining uh, uh, quantum but e is not uh, just carbon uh, e is many other things and i mean we can look at the internal power of mining companies as we get new hydro coming in or other means of sustainability going forward some smaller things but really important is to increase monitoring of electricity and how mines are, are using that electricity to go forward. We've got equipment providers such as Komatsu doing joint ventures uh, to come up with uh, zero emission trucks. Uh, biodiversity action plans are happening after TNFD was announced last year. Uh, biodiversity action plans are happening across all producers at the moment and beyond that. There's now an encouragement by uh, ICMM and others, uh, I think came out earlier this year with a nature positive approach. A really important uh, part, I think, of trying to change, change the transformation and the perception of this sector. Uh, local agriculture, uh, another real focus when it comes down to the operational side, uh, to uh, support local communities as part of local agriculture, making sure there's less conflict there, uh, improving prosperity, ed 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 education and health uh, goes into that. Uh, we've got noise and dust as well, which is, of course, an obvious issue, which has always been around mines and how we can remove that along with vibration. Water, I mean, there's a list of six, seven, eight different things with regards to water as they fit into the environmental thing, how we improve that, and that definitely affects the social side 
uh, of uh, uh, local relationships and uh, everything. So the new minds of the future are incorporating all of this as part of that E. Uh, it affects very much the social side, so it, the, very much the interoperability between those two. And then that really comes down to, I guess, none of that is possible without the G as well. So even though the question was very much, where are we on the E, all of this is integrated uh, within each other. And how does the second part of the question is, how's that affecting the investors? I mean, there are huge diversities here. I mean, there are a lot of junior companies here who can still get away with two, $3 million fundraisings and not have to deal an awful lot with the uh, disclosure and reporting of, uh, of, of ESG. That's a fact of life. I think it's probably changing, it's evolving, and it will come further as smaller companies get pulled into some of the uh, compliance and re uh, requirements. But beyond that, I think um, we shouldn't be blind to what the supply chain is asking for. I was talking to companies this morning about some of the OEMs, uh, both in China and in Europe recently, as to the, their demands at the moment. That's increasing. We've just seen the uh, ESG requirements in China being, uh, uh, being improved, uh, announced four or five weeks ago. So ultimately, I think uh, really where it comes down to is investors want to reduce risk. Sustainability and responsibility is a way of doing that. Um, they want to protect their reputations. They want to ensure projects that they're investing in are sustainable for the future. Uh, and so that they can enter the supply chain uh, with not necessarily premiums, and today's not going to be a conversation about premium pricing, but to make sure that they enter that supply chain accepted as being sustainable. Sure. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And so I, I guess there's a lot of really attractive, exciting opportunities and sort of sub-segments within decarbonization. I wanted to touch on a couple of these, both of which, you know, your funds are invested in mobility and battery recycling. And uh, maybe, Swetchy, we'll start with you on mobility. I mean, what makes that such an exciting you know, part of decarbonization, and what are you guys doing there? Yeah, yeah I think the electrification mobility has been quite a central uh, um, focus within the thematic of decarbonization. And one of the key reasons uh, driving this uh, sector's uh, growth is really around the de-risking of it being an asset class. Uh, from a technology perspective, this is a proven, reliable, um, de declining cost technology. Um, when you look at it from a total cost of ownership perspective between internal combustion engine vehicles versus uh, electric vehicle, we are reaching, we are parity in a lot of places. Uh, and that definitely helps to drive a lot of the adoption. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, with this, uh, you know, this, uh, this total cost of ownership kind of getting to parity, it means that it has opened up an entire value chain of uh, EV um, that is open for investments uh, from not just your OEMs, but all the way to your charging technologies, your softwares, as well as your battery technology there. And then if I split this sector from a geographical perspective, each region, country has its own uh, um, space in terms of the adoption curve. China, being the most advanced uh, EV economy in the world, uh, has evolved its value chain so much that we're no longer just talking about passenger OEMs uh, makers as investment opportunity. Uh, the spotlight now is on, uh, for example, commercial EVs as a service, uh, whereby you know large logistic companies are very keen to decarbonize and they are leaning on you know, services company, giving them a full rep service all the way from leasing, insurance, as well as uh, operational and maintenance. And then looking to South Asia, India, another very interesting place, uh, has its own unique way of uh, uh, developing the e-mobility space, uh, very much focused on the three-wheelers and the two-wheelers market, which fits the price point uh, for the stage of uh, the economic development there. And, and I, I can't help it being very uh, geeky about the battery technology is that uh, battery technology is going to drive continuous cost down for the EVs. It is a key pillar for that. And uh, when I look at the technology development in battery, there are lots of them. But what is immediate is really uh, in this particular space for the air nodes of the battery. Uh, we are, I'm very, very excited about this technology uh, in the silicon carbon air node uh, uh, space whereby it can increase energy density of uh, batteries significantly, increase the driving range significantly, increase the charging 
uh, rate significantly and hence driving adoption. So companies like Group 14 uh, based in Seattle uh, is one example where it can drive the energy density up by 30-50%, drive down costs significantly and what's important for uh, battery gigafactory manufacturers, if anyone of you out there, is that it can actually increase your capacity of your gigafactory by 30 to 50 percent effectively without having to put in new capital investments. Excellent. And yeah, Andrew, how about on your side in terms of the batteries recycling? Yeah, no, I, I think for us, right, I, uh, that, that thesis has sort of uh, evolved as we you know, create a new fund. And so originally, you know, we were focused more on the battery chemistry side of things, but uh, we ended up not deciding to invest there, and we invested in charging infrastructure. But I think now with the trend of electrification, you know, that, that's what she mentioned, you know, we're, we're at a point that you're sort of at this you know, critical mass of uh, potential batteries that can be recycled. Um, so, you know, that just increases the market size, makes it a lot more attractive for investors, for starters to come in and solve this problem there. Um, and then secondly as well, I think from that uh, technology side of things, right, the technology that's being used right now in battery recycling, it really revolves around just two things, which is uh, pyrometallurgy or hydrometallurgy. You know, it's either you're burning it up or either you're, you're running through a chemical bath. So I think there's a lot of room for uh, innovation there, uh, you know, besides, you know, things like direct battery recycling, uh, which we think is still, you know, a bit further down the road. Uh, I think you know, improving the, the current status quo is, is uh, I think, the way to go here. Um, and then also, thirdly, I think, you know, from that, you know, access to minerals point of view as well, right? Um, a lot of talk about, you know, where do we get these minerals? You know, how much are these minerals are, right? And we saw the spikes uh, of, of you know, lithium, nickel, cobalt over the past few years. Um, so how do you get, like, a stable supply of that? I think, you know, battery recycling helps uh, you know, address that problem as well. Um, and I think, finally, you know, from geopolitics point of view, right? I mean, the world is sort of splitting into two now. So your battery recycling plants in China no longer maybe can't be relied on 100%. So people will be building these new battery plants uh, around the world, whether it's the states, wherever it is. And actually, you know, quite a bit of the you know, scrap that comes from that source for EV recycling is actually coming from the point of manufacture. Um, so with all these new battery plants coming up, there's going to be a lot more sources of, of battery scrap to use for recycling. So I think this, you know, all these um, you know, factors really led us to believe that you know, battery recycling is the way to go, um, and not to mention the, I guess, the favorable uh, you know, regulatory environment that's being you know, put up in the EU and in the US as well, right? So, um, so we did end up making an investment in a company here called uh, Green Lion. Uh, so they do uh, exactly that, which is help improve that process uh, in terms of the hydrometallurgy uh, process there that you know, cuts out a few steps and you get right to the I guess that, that uh, cathode active material that people are looking for. Um, so no, I think there's a lot more room for improvement and that, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're investing in that space. Excellent, thanks. And yeah, I wanted to touch on also, obviously this being a predominantly APAC focused conference, you know, the differences between APAC and other regions. Obviously, APAC historically has been seen as you know, a laggard in decarbonization and ESG relative to what's happening in other regions, but I think you know, if you look at where the, the lowest hanging fruit is and, and where the greatest opportunities for improvement are, I, you know, I really believe it's in Asia Pacific. So, Jamie, I mean, from your side, what are you seeing in terms of the companies, their attitudes towards ESG disclosures in APAC versus the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the, the flow of funds, I mean, I think in Australia, 46% of all funds under management are now sustainable in one shape, form or another. I think the fastest uh, asset class in China is uh, ESG funds at the moment, from what I last read. So, the, you know, the, follow the money, as they say. Um, so I think, you know, to some extent, there's been a bit of catch up, but I think is now kind of getting closer to that, uh, not maybe parity with Europe, but certainly moving in that direction. Um, the impact, I think, has got to be seen on both sides. It's, you know, it's a kind of risk mitigator uh, from some angles with regards to portfolios, operations and reputation. Um, but at the same time, it's a, it's, it's a value enhancer. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the sector we've got to respect that the, the mining sector generally is regarded as the least trusted, most uh, um, under, well, low valuation and high cost of capital sector uh, against most of its peer sectors. So on that basis, how can we drive confidence, trust uh, and execution through that and through the means of uh, doing that and therefore being able to feed the decarbonization story uh, and the obviously the electric revolution that we're seeing. So from that perspective, I think there are some really great opportunities. How can we mitigate risk for portfolio managers? How can we improve the time uh, to go through due diligence processes? How can we be better prepared? How can we prepare these? Um, how can we prepare these assets for the future so that they enter the supply chain in a more effective way, which meets the uh, requirements of the supply chain? 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, follow the money is, uh, is what I would say. It's a good theme, yeah. And to touch on that, we, we were going to run through the APAC investment opportunity versus the rest of the world, but I think we're running out of time here. So we'll, you guys will have to grab Switchy and Andrew to discuss that for a coffee later. But I want to thank our panelists uh, for their time here and, and their views. A lot of interesting points and themes that they've made. And um, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. That is a really interesting conversation. And if you want to let people know about it, I've actually just, this sounds terrible. I've got a, a group of younger people in my family who are all into investing at the moment. I've said, you guys need to follow this and listen to the conversations that we're, we're having because they really will guide, especially the next generation of investors in where they want to go. So let people know that they can watch this conference online afterwards and, and really dive into those those things that we're saying. But for us, it's being able to go out there, it's being able to talk and it's being able to interact, which will make, really make a difference for us. But this last one, uh, we won't have the opportunity to talk to her. She is a ridiculously busy human being. Nevertheless, she's put together a piece for us. This is a conversation between um, Christy Batten and Ashley Zomwatt Forbes. Now, she is the Director of Batteries and Critical Minerals for the US Department of Energy. It's a really interesting conversation and I trust that you get a lot out of it. When this finishes playing, then I'd like to invite you all outside to enjoy some lunch with us. And when you hear the bell ring, that is the time to race back in here for our next uh, lot of investment opportunities. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for that introduction, Christy. It's wonderful to be here, even though just virtual. Um, so as Christy said, I'm Ashley Zumwalt Forbes, and I'm the U.S. Deputy Director for Batteries and Critical Materials. I sit in the Department of Energy, specifically the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the U.S. government or familiar with that variety of acronyms and, and words I just threw at you, MESC, so Manufacturing and Office of Energy Supply Chains, um, was set up a little bit over two years ago to deploy bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act, so Bill and IRA Capital. Um, and the, the accomplishments across those two years have been immense. Now, I cannot take credit for those accomplishments. I just joined uh, on January 15th. And so some of you, if, if you know me at all, you might know me from um, Black Mountain Metals or Metals Acquisition Corp, or just generally kicking around the mining space. Um, very much still incredibly passionate about both mining and the critical material supply chain. Um, in terms of my why, my why for doing this, my why for transitioning to government, albeit for a, for a short stint, not for my entire career, um, is I, I had a daughter 18 months ago, and I think it's so important to keep the why of, of doing work front and center. And for me, I want to ensure that I'm leaving the world a better place for her than, than what I inherited. So on behalf of the Deputy Director for batter Batteries and Critical Materials and of Lola's mom, I truly appreciate the work that all of you are doing to actualize these supply chains and, and really throw your shoulder into the effort of realizing this enormous goal. So we'll get into it if I can make my slides go. There, okay. Um, so, We've covered, MESC was set up to deploy bill in IRA capital. Specifically, that's around $20 billion, which we will break down in future slides. But what does that actually look like? Like, what does it mean that we do? Um, and that does mean so something a bit different on, on any given day. Um, but the overall goals of MESC are to, one, eliminate vulnerabilities in the U.S. clean energy supply chains. Two, drive unparalleled social, economic, and environmental impact through programs and awards. I would like to do a sub-bullet to this and say something incredibly relevant and uh, an enormous focus area for me 
is that economic impact piece. Um, I'm extremely focused on ensuring that the investments we're making are long-term cost competitive and are able to get built, stay in business, be excellent contributors to our supply chain and continue employing folks long past when we have made the investment. So there's end of my sub bullet. I'll get back to back to my list. But um, the third prong of, of kind of the MESC vision is to ensure the equipment and materials are available when needed. I don't have to tell I don't have to tell y'all. You know, you 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 work in this day in and day out, but certainly COVID brought up so many exposures within our supply chains and so many needs for future development. And this is truly a response to that awareness. And then lastly, the vision and goal of MESC is to reduce our risks of, of reliance on potentially adverse interests. Um, so how do we do that? How do we accomplish these very broad, big goals? Um, and it really is focusing on four key areas. So one, manufacturing. Um, we are very focused on bringing back made in America. Uh, number two, supply chains. Um, so really de-risking supply chains for critical energy system needs. Three, workforce. Um, again, not telling you guys anything you don't know, but just because we're able to build out the supply chain, raise the money, you know, do this enormous task, it doesn't mean we're actually going to have people who have the training um, and, and the desire to, to work in these facilities. And so there's a tremendous amount of work around um, skilling up the appropriate number of folks to, 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 to work in these supply chains and really drive the ball down the field. And then last, um, the, the manufacturing analytics back. And that really sits under all three of these pillars. And really what that looks like is an enormous data uh, processing effort to identify where our weaknesses are and where our capital can be best deployed. So we'll skip to the next one. Okay, so again, a lot of acronyms. The, the government loves acronyms. Um, I have only been in the seat since the 15th of January. So many of these acronyms are, are new to me. Um, so I, I feel your pain and I will do my best to address them. Um, but all of the acronyms on this chart outline different offices within the Department of Energy, all of which have capital available at different scales. Um, so you see on the x-axis, they're highlighting commercialization. Um, and on the y-axis, focused on technology readiness level. And so many of you might know LPO. Um, LPO is often kind of considered the, the front door of the DOE. Um, and LPO is the loan program office. It offers de um, affordable debt financing to various entities within kind of that clean energy supply chain. We are just ahead of LPO, or may, maybe behind. So potentially lower TRL levels, potentially less commercialization readiness. Um, we offer financing in the form of either grants or tax credits, which again, we will address soon. But historically, the Department of Energy Purpose has very much been focused on earlier TRLs, much early, earlier commercialization stages. And so the availability of both MESC and LPO represent real step changes in the ability for companies to scale that valley of debt um, and really build true, scalable, um, real commercialized businesses. And for me, I think that's so exciting. So next one. Okay. So I highlighted that MESC has been around for two years. I have been around for two months, but MESC has funded 71 projects across 38 states. Um, so these MESC is U.S. specific funding. It can be non-U.S. companies, but the projects themselves have to be in the U.S. 
Um, so look, this is a lot, a lot to have been done in two years. Um, you can see kind of the, the various colors. Hopefully you're not colorblind. I'm sorry. If so, we'll need to find a, a better way to, to view this chart. Um, but you can see from the various colors on the legend, the programs which which were leveraged to fund these operations. Several of them I will be touching on today. Um, importantly, sorry, I'm, just, I'm always supposed to plug this, but um, this is the status for January 2024. We are very much not done. We have many open funding opportunities, which you can find on the MESC website, which um, we, we will get to soon. Um, we very much welcome additional applications. You know, my interest is in ensuring we are deploying taxpayer capital in the most effective and impactful way possible. And the way we do that is ensuring we get as many applicants as possible uh, to really raise that quality bar and ensure we are being good stewards of the capital that we have been given. Next one. Okay, so I'm sure you guys see this chart and think like, oh God, is she about to walk through a very basic um, kind of supply chain chart? I'm not, I, I, will, I will save you that. Um, a few things I'd like to call attention to. So um, we spoke about in the beginning, MESC was created to uh, deploy bill and IRA funding. So bipartisan infrastructure law and inflation reduction act. Y'all haven't heard a word about Defense Production Act, but it is on the slide and I will cover it. Um, so Bill and Ira Capital, you can see they stretch. Uh, so Bill goes from material processing, importantly, not mining. Um, Bill stretches from material processing through battery manufacturing and then pops up again on the back end with recycling efforts funding. So you can see it's about six billion and then $335 million available. Inflation Reduction Act. So you can see this stretches across the supply chain in the form of tax credits. So 45X and 30D. Um, Defense Production Act. Um, it is mostly as as you would as would be indicated by its name, but it is mostly stewarded by the Department of um, and you can see they do fund mining. Um, the DOE application of Defense Production Act, it's, it's specifically called Defense Production Act Title III, but the DOE access to DPA is in the form of heat pump financing. So you might have seen that on the prior slide. Um, there are additional authorizations, just no allocations of capital from funds. Okay, so this is the breakdown of the $20 billion. Um, and so this is $20 billion sitting within MESC. So you can see um, on the left side of the step chart, 10 billion in the form of tax credits and rebates, 6.2 billion sitting within batteries and critical minerals. So um, that, that's, that's my office. Um, and so again, that is in the form of grants. Um, EV manufacturing conversion, um, that's $2 billion. The workforce program is $1.5 billion. DPA heat pumps, which we talked about, is $250 million. And so that totals into $20 billion to be deployed. Um, this, we've deployed $2.8 billion to date. Importantly, and I think this is absolutely critical, this funding requires the private sector match. So at least 50% of the project must be funded by the private sector. Um, why is this important? It shows that the project operator has skin in the game. It shows that the project can also pass muster of XYZ financial institution in the private market. Um, and additionally, it stimulates more activity in the economy. So one item to cover on this slide is um how to apply for this funding um so we we deployed 1.9 billion dollars within the battery and critical materials supply chain late last year we're currently in round two of that initiative <clears throat> so here's how it works we 
being the DOE, publish an FOA, Funding Opportunity Announcement, we call it a FOA, um, on the MESC website, which you'll get a link to shortly. Within that FOA, there are delineated areas of interest, so AOIs, which folks can submit applications to. And I always like to highlight these AOIs are, are all the way across the supply chain. So we're not just focused on one area, but rather the entire thing. Like we want to build out an entire supply chain in the US. Um, so I'd like to just read to you what these AOIs are so that you can get a flavor of what we're looking for. <clears throat> and importantly, um, you know, these AOIs came out of that data analytics backbone that we talked about on the first slide. And so this is really where we see the greatest needs for investment in that U.S. supply chain. So one is lithium separation. Two is recovery of battery critical minerals. Three is battery material precursor processing. Four, battery cathode and anode manufacturing. Five, electrolyte salts and solvents. Six, cell manufacturing for small and specialized markets, seven non-lithium based battery cell and system production, eight other battery cell and system component manufacturing. So again, all the way across the supply chain. So on this one, I just said, I just said that we deployed $1.9 billion late last year. And then at the top of the slide, I say over $5.8 billion in public private investment has been stimulated. <clears throat> how <laughs> how did we get there? Um, so this is, so I reference that there has to be a private capital match of at least 50%. In many cases, there are mu there's a much larger private capital match. And so this $5.8 billion is what has been stimulated through this grant program of both public plus private. Um, so these are the 15 current portfolio companies. It um, again ranges cathode investments, anode investments, precursors, recycling, and mineral processing. Here's an example um, of, of one of our companies. It's a group called Mexichem. They are building a lithium hexafluorophosphate plant in Louisiana, um, and it is a first of its kind in the US. So it was a $100 million U.S. government investment, over $300 million private sector match, 80 jobs created, 260,000 EVs enabled, and will produce 10,000 metric tons per year. So there are a tremendous amount of funding opportunities available. Please go to the MESC website and look at these opportunities. <clears throat> On one of the coming slides, there's a... Uh, a thing that you can take a picture of and it'll take you there. Um, or if you Google DOE mask, it will take you there. Um, go to my LinkedIn, you'll find it there. Like there are options for getting to this website um, and there is money that you can apply for. So please do. Um, this, I would love everyone's participation. This says comments were due March 4th. That is not true. We have um, extended that deadline and would absolutely love your comments. Um, and so, so what, what is this? This is how to connect federal funding with private capital. So if you have thoughts on how best to match grantees with private capital, what you're looking for, what the needs are, really what instruments you think are missing in the market, please share it um, at, at this QR code. Okay, so I said MESC has been in existence for two years. Um, here's what we've done to date. So we have catalyzed over $7 billion of private sector investment. We've created over 8,000 jobs. 34% of those investments are in energy justice communities. We've trained over 500 students annually and we've enabled 10 million EVs annually. Um, this story is very much not done. In fact, we are only getting started. We would love to partner with you on accomplishments to come. Um, so together, we can develop a domestic battery manufacturing industry that competes globally and wins. Thank you so much.
Come on, enjoy some lunch, have some strong conversations with people, and you hear the bell ring, that's your indication to come back in. We'll have about 25 minutes for lunch, but it's up to you how you spend your time here today. Thank you.